The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio. Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Any rebroadcast, reproduction, or other use of this broadcast or podcast without the express written consent of Spaced Out Radio or Spaced Out Radio Limited is strictly prohibited. Listener discretion is advised. You experienced Step right there. Top the mountains of British Columbia to you listening around the world. This is Spaced Out Radio with host Dave Scott. They let us play with all our toys. They let us think that we're big boys. They let us make a lot of noise, but we're in the world. They let us think we're Superman. You can follow us on our website, spacedoutradio.com, on iTunes, and tune in. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. On Facebook at Spaced Out Radio Show, or on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Are you playing with Bigfoot and aliens again? Uh, Dad, you gotta stop haunting the goat. It's scaring them. All right, seriously, put down the pointy sticks. Look, Dave! Game on! Game on! Game on! <laughs> The password is... All right, all right, all right. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride on Spaced Out Radio. Mr. Bumblefoot, Dave is ready for liftoff. Seriously, Dave? Really? Aren't you a little old for a tinfoil hat? I am. Toby! Bye-bye! Yes, you! Bye-bye! Kickers, please take your seat of our roll. There will be a good chance to kick off. Start. Two. One. Boost the ignition. And lift off. Good evening and welcome to Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, and it's good to have you along for the ride on this Thursday, July 20th. 
Friday, July 21st. If you're on the East Coast or across the pond, hope you had a great day at night. We are live right here in the Great White North on top of the Rainy Mountains. Listen to me for a second. The Rainy Mountains of Central British Columbia. Thank you, Lord, for bringing the rain as we've needed it with these forest fires as we are here seven days a week. We welcome in everyone listening in on WQEE 99. Rock the key down in noon in Georgia, home of the Walking Dead. We are live as well on the United Public Radio Network on 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. We're live at spacedoutradio.com, Spreaker, KTLK, The Fringe FM, Renegade Talk Radio out of Las Vegas, the High Plains Talk Radio Network, and on Revolution Radio. Remember, the Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Head on over to freedomslips.com. And donate today. If you like our music, get your horns up for Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal, formerly of Guns N' Roses, currently of Art of Anarchy, out on tour on the east coast of the United States. Bumblefoot is the official sound of SOR. If you're on social media, you can give us a follow on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, follow me at Dave Scott SOR. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can now listen to us on iHeartRadio in the United States. Tune in, download our shows from iTunes. We're also on Player.fm, RadioGuide.fm, TalkStream Live, and Stitcher. And of course, our website is SpacedOutRadio.com. And if you head over to Patreon.com for as low as a dollar a month, you can become a patron of SOR as well. Now, if you want to take part in this show, you got to sign into one of our chat rooms. All right, you go to Revolution Radio, Spreaker, the UPRN chat room, or on Facebook at the SOR Space Travelers Club. Or if you're on Twitter, go to hashtag Spaced Out Radio. I will get to your questions and comments in there as well. Now, if you head to our website, which looks great, by the way, as we've just redone it, for five bucks a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. You can check out the plethora of features that we have, including going to the Spaced Out Radio store, picking up a t-shirt, posters, stickers, Paracon tickets, and more. Read up on the Encounter Online, dealing with everything paranormal, courtesy of our editors, Eric Martin. Markham and Everett Themer. Check out my latest blog, and if you've had a sighting you can't explain, fill out an SOR Sightlines report. And also, check out the videos from UFO Seekers, Tim Doyle, as he is the man behind our investigations of what is flying up in the friendly skies. The third Thursday of every month, we get a little rebellious around these parts. Jamie Sexton, out of Las Vegas, my home away from home, comes in with his new feature, The Rebel Planet. Rebel Planet News is a newly forming alternative media site that will launch later here in 2017. Jamie is someone who delves into the truth behind what the stories are that you see on the mainstream news. You see, sometimes it's the story behind the story as to where the truth truly lies, whether it's government conspiracies or fake news or even hidden secrets to some of the most secret societies around. Jamie, through his connections in both music, acting, and political, has led him to some incredible contacts for information that he is now going to share to you. But before we bring Jamie on, and actually we're going to bring Jamie on right now, but we're also joined for a few moments by the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy. Gentlemen, how are you? I'm doing well, sir. Thank you very much for having me on, even for a brief period of time. Oh, no problem. And Jamie, how are you doing, my friend? You might want to turn your microphone on. <laughs> I'm doing good, man. Can you oh, hear me there, now? Yeah, there you are. There you are. Now, Jamie, <laughs> the, there's a little story behind why we brought the crypto guru on today, because your lovely girlfriend, Tiffany, mm-hmm. is infatuated with unicorns. It is so much so that she has literally <laughs> thrown pillows at you saying they are real. They are real. Yes. So, so Crypto Guru, we need to know right off the bat, because you're our resident expert around here, we need to know, are unicorns real? Um, for anybody with the name of Tiffany, which is one of my favorite female names, I will tell you unequivocally, yes, indeed, they are real. Uh, they have been something that have been, you know, sought after, since uh, well before the Middle Ages. I mean, we, we have, you know, rumors of these things going back into the Greco-Roman period. Um, but it's really the Middle Ages that they, they, it, it hits the ground running about the quest for uh, obtaining the unicorn um, horn. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, I mean, these are and have always been seen as genuine creatures that you could easily find out there. Now, the problem is, where do you find them? Uh, there are traditions of finding them in the Orient, that these are something that are, you know, far off, uh, you know, remnant populations of some superior race of animals that could only be found in the Far East. That comes a little bit later. Uh, but whenever you look at tells from the, uh, from, from Britain, uh, in, uh, the time of the Dark Ages, it was believed that they were right there in the sceptered owl itself. I mean, so people were looking for these things. Now, Going back, and this is uh, odd because this is a conspiracy show, uh, but, uh, you know, a, a conspiracy developed because people were wanting to have um, the unicorn horn not only as proof, but as a talisman against evil. So they uh, were, uh, you know, inundated in the marketplace uh, by uh, unscrupulous uh, uh, merchants that would, you know, had no problem supplying unicorn horn to the masses, and they were believed to use narwhal tusks, um, which have this kind of cylindrical spiral type of horn. Um, so this kind of muddies the waters a bit whenever we are looking for the true, actual uh, unicorn, because people are going to assume that this narwhal was the explanation for everything that was unicorn, but indeed that is not the case. That was for people that wanted uh, relics of such a creature. Um, the unicorn always was seen to have magical powers, uh, but by the time that the Christian faith really took hold in Britain, it was seen as a symbol of Christianity. The unicorn was actually a Christ-like figure, and the maiden who uh, would be able to subdue this figure uh, turned into be the Virgin Mary. Uh, but it's a long uh, tradition, and maybe the next time I come on to the show, my friend, uh, we can do a, uh, a special just on unicorns uh, for Tiffany. We'll, we'll, we'll have Tiffany on here. She can ask any kind of questions that she wants to ask. Uh, it is a fascinating subject. It's, it's, a, it's a subject that's very poetic. It's, it's a subject that has conspiracy, like I had mentioned. Uh, it follows paganism and it follows Christianity. Uh, and it's really a cool look at the way, uh, you know, uh, legends are spread. But yes, for a short answer, uh, Tiffany, uh, Russ assured that unicorns, if they are still not out there in some remote area, they did indeed once hoof around this planet of ours. Jamie, I think we just lost our argument there. Yeah, yeah, I'll never hear the end of it. But you know what? A happy girl is a happy world, so uh, that's good news. <laughs> that's right. I mean, you can, you can look at, I mean, there are people that have, uh, you know, um, there are knights and, and lords and ladies that have as their banner symbol the unicorn. If you walk over London Bridge to this very day, you have a unicorn as part of uh, the anifix that's uh, attached to the bridge. So, you know, England still holds this tradition of uh, of the unicorn. I mean, uh, now we can look into the area, you know, if this was a horse with a horn on its head or if this was some sort of goat-like figure because the, the, the image of the actual animal does fluctuate throughout history as well. Uh, but for the long and short of it, uh, the unicorn is still a symbol of, uh, of the, uh, the, the, the royal ruling hierarchy of, of, of England this very day. Well, you know what, Guru, this is why we brought you on here, because we needed to find out the truth, and if we were going to get it from anybody, we were going to get it from you. <laughs> so there you go. if Tiffany... If Tiffany, or let's say Jamie, wanted to send Tiffany on a trip to go try and uh -huh. find the elusive unicorn, where should she start? Um, <laughs> this is this is an awesome, awesome question. Um, if if you would look at the way people have written about such a thing, uh, it would be either in the Far East, uh, China. Or even India. India has, has, you know, has been a, a very popular destination since Alexander the Great, and this is where these kind of fabled creatures are said to reside. 
But if I were a betting person, and you know how I enjoy delving into the world of, of, of the fairy, uh, I would say go to Ireland. That's where I would go, because I think any kind of enchanted creature uh, would be found in this kind of fairy world uh, that uh, is the, 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 the veil between this world and that world uh, is at its thinnest in certain places of Ireland. It's always believed to be that way. And if Tiffany is of pure heart, which I assume that she is, because any girl that has an interest in unicorns has to be a pure heart, but I bet if she would go there and open herself up to the, the powers that be, uh, a creature such as the unicorn may indeed manifest itself for her. Very nice indeed. In the deserts of Las Vegas, Jamie, on one of those romantic nights where the chemtrails are flying over beautifully, you know, <laughs> you, know you, you can get Tiffany to go out under the stars and the chemtrails to manifest a unicorn, according to the crypto guru. <laughs> A quarter, that's absolutely the case, you know. Uh, and if Tiffany does happen to have any single friends, I'll be more than happy to go out on an expedition, and I'll guide it myself. Wow. <laughs> wow. Oh, I think, oh, 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 it's steel. He's moving in. He, the guru is moving in. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> run, um, run. You know what? This would, this, this would be an interesting thing. I'll, I'll tell you what. If, if sometime, maybe in the uh, near future, we'll get Dave over there to uh, Las Vegas, and we'll get some really true, ardent believers in the unicorn. We'll go out in the desert, and we'll do a live broadcast and see if our energies can actually oh, inspire yeah. such a creature to reveal itself. With my problem, she'd probably be ugly. You know, but that's okay. Hey, I, I got one quick question from the audience here, and this is the only one we're going to take because, uh, Guru, I know you got to run here. You got an early morning ahead. You were doing us a favor for Tiffany here. But uh, John is asking, are unicorns then interdimensional creatures in your opinion? Well, see, that's, that's the whole crux of this argument. Um, I would have to say yes, and the reason why I say yes is because the unicorn was always seen as a magical creature, um, and the, the horn was seen as a way to um, commune with uh, the other side. It's a magical creature, thus it would have uh, its footing in the world of the, the Fae, the Goblin universe, whatever you would like to call it. Um, but yes, I would say that when we talk about interdimensionality, and of course Beautiful. this is kind of a touchy subject because it does get down to mm -hmm. kind of uh, quantum physics, and I don't want it to sound too hokey because on a scientific level it truly mm -hmm. is not, but to say that it's completely of this world, I think is doing an injustice to the legend of the unicorn. Beautiful. Guru, when can we expect you back? Because i got a lot of people asking when you are going to come back from your hiatus here. You've been going that's through some, some issues, some family issues that you're currently cleaning up, and that's why you have been on a break. But you know what? We are, I know there are many in our audience who are very excited to hear from you again. Yeah, you know what, and I am very, very excited to jump back into it. Uh, for those of the people that do not know, I am going through a divorce, something that I never thought would ever happen to me. And it was really out of the blue that this happened to me. Uh, I think that everybody can read between the lines that I was sort of blindsided by this. So uh, that being said, um, I have had to take on a different role in the family, uh, having, you know, five kids and everything. So I have had to go do things that are a little bit outside of the, my normal realm of writing and doing conferences. So, um, uh, my contract that I have right now is going to be up uh, uh, within a month. So I'm hoping that I will be able to do a show in August. If worse comes to absolute worse, it will be September. But I'm just looking for a time where I don't have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning because, of course, this show being on the West Coast, that will give me right around an hour and a half of sleep. So uh, I'm looking for a time just whenever I will be able to actually just segue right in there and not miss the beat again. But if not, next month, my friend, it will definitely be in September, and I'm looking forward to uh, to talking to all the uh, spaced out uh, fanatics out there. Absolutely, the crypto guru Ronald Murphy talking unicorns tonight for the first little bit of this show. Ron, you go get some sleep. Appreciate you taking the time, and we'll talk to you very soon. I'll give you a call tomorrow. Hey, I hope I, I hope all the spaced out listeners uh, keep me in their thoughts too. I would be greatly appreciative of that. Yes, yeah. Tiffany says uh, thank you to you guys. So. <laughs> 
Not a problem. Not a problem. Ron, take care. We'll let you go. And uh, Jamie, you stick around because you're you're kind of my guest tonight. <laughs> I'll, we'll I'll hang out there. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, Guru, take care. That's uh, the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, coming in. Now, once again, if you're just tuning in wondering why the hell we're talking about unicorns on a night when we're supposed to be talking with Jamie Sexton, Jamie's lovely girlfriend, Tiffany, is always debating with him about the reality of unicorns. So we had to end that debate tonight. Jamie, I'm going to tell you right now, you and I, in our my opinion, because our opinions are the same, we lost. We yeah, lost to we the did. guru. You know, well, Tiff- Tiffany's happy, so... <laughs> yes, I'm sure she is gloating around right now. I can't she see is. her. She's yeah. probably gloating, gloating around, probably give you a couple middle fingers saying, I told you so, man, I told you so. <laughs> yeah, we'll probably be booking a trip to Ireland this year, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Anyways, Jamie Sexton from Rebel Planet News, my friend, you come on the first, or the, make that the third Thursday of every month. How are you doing? How you been up to? Been good, man. Got some, uh, you know, we all got some bad news today about uh, Chester uh, Bennington from uh, Lincoln Park. Um, it's, it's. I think the last time I was on, we we got the same news about Chris Cornell. Ironically, wasn't it? Yeah, this isn't lining up very good for us. Mm. You know, it really isn't. Now, did you know Chester? Uh, no, I didn't know him personally. I, I, I you know, I, I'd met him around at festivals and. Uh, a few events here and there um, over the years, uh, but I didn't know him personally. But uh, really nice guy, totally nice, and really powerful singer. Um, I, I I think the last time I saw him perform live was with um, the Kings of Chaos, I believe it was the name of it. It was uh, kind of a super group with uh, Matt Sorm from Guns N' Roses and uh, Corey Taylor from Slipknot and Stone Sour and um, uh, Billy Duffy from The Cult and Steve Stevens from uh, Billy Idol and uh, Billy Gibbons. They, they, they all kind of got together and did like a super group uh, tour and Chester sang with them. And he, he was the most powerful uh, force in the show, if you ask me. Just really strong voice. Great guy. What is with depression and singers? I mean, the rest of us tend to think, okay, that... You know, these here's guys that are living the dream life of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and you know they are they are people who are are loved by millions, and they just it's not enough. Why is that? Well, I I don't know that I can speak for everyone, but I guess if I had to hypothesize, and I I am a singer myself, I guess um, you know. I think a lot of artists suffer from um, mild forms of depression. I've, I've, I've heard that a lot and I've even experienced it uh, myself where, you know, sometimes your best stuff, your best art comes out of digging into those areas that you might not want to dig into. And, And sometimes you write your best stuff or create your best stuff at the hardest times in your life. So, you know, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's floating around in that in that dark area or you know that deep area that you you tend to dwell and maybe uh, you know you, you you kind of search there where, where a lot of people maybe tend to repel those things as quickly as they can. I think artists spend a little more time there to create. So I mean that's that's a theory, but I sort of feel that way. I know that you know some of the hardest crap I've ever been through in my life I you know pinned my best stuff and most creative so maybe that has something to do with it um unfortunately I think also a lot of people do uh tend to to experiment with substance and things like that so with a lot of these stories we hear that kind of thing and that's unfortunate I think any time that you you know uh, alter your thinking you're doing just that you know you're altering your thinking you're not really in in your best frame of mind and uh so you know there's all sorts of reasons but at the end of the day you you know and and somebody asked me about this today i think i even posted on it you just don't um you just never know 
what somebody's internally feeling and thinking. Um, you just never know. Even you could you could live with somebody you could be married to them you could be dating them you could sleep next to them you could be your best friend and you still may not know what they're feeling internally you know <clears throat> a lot of times these days we'll ask people just casually you know hey how you doing and everybody the, the go-to answer is oh i'm fine i'm good even when they're not and you know they're not so i don't know i think it's hard to it's hard to know have you ever done the opposite? I know when I was very depressed going through my first divorce, well, my only divorce to this date. I've got a plan for number two here. I got to, you know, you never know when that's going to happen. But you it's still got to be prepared like a Boy Scout. But when I was going through my divorce, I remember a lot of people would call me up, hey, how you doing? And I would just say to them, I'm terrible. I'm not doing well. And it's amazing how many people are so fixed on that answer of, I'm great. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I, I someone uh, on, on one of my friends, uh, he's a DJ here, in, uh, a radio uh, DJ on a rock station here in Vegas. And he and I have been friends forever. And um, he, uh, he posted a chorus about, about Chester and um, and uh, what had happened early in the day, and then people started commenting on it, and um, you know it, it's frustrating for people, um, especially if you're close to someone. <clears throat> it's frustrating um, and it's it's hurtful and it's painful and it's confusing because you you just uh, people can't explain it. You know they don't they don't understand it and um, and. Uh, I think one of the things that, that's common, like even when, when Robin Williams passed and uh, Chris Cornell and, and some other people, some, some you know, uh, famous and um, notable people have taken their own life. I think the question arises, well, why would they do that? It seems like they had, you know, everything going for them. And I think that it's important to remember that, you know, no matter what, level of status you are in life no matter how successful you are you're still a human being and i think internally we all process things similar you know and um it's it's how you handle those things that are coming to you and um you know they're 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 human beings like the rest of us are and i just don't know it's it's hard to know what's what's in someone else's mind and why they do what they do but i'll tell you one thing it's it's when you get to that point you're that low um and i've experienced i've had my own problems with depression in life you know when when you start having really challenging thoughts like that you know a pep talk or a night out with the boys or you know uh it, a pat on the back or some you know, um, patronizing sort of gloss over, uh, you know, uh, statements and sentiments just aren't enough sometimes. And, I, and, and that's not to fault uh, caring people. You know, people always say, hey, listen, if you're, if you're not feeling well, reach out. But, um, and your question was, have I ever done the opposite or have I ever witnessed the opposite? Um, I said all that to say this. Someone commented on uh, on my friend's um, post today, and they said, well, they brought up a really good point that sometimes when you reach out for help, you know, you don't, uh, you don't always get the reception that you need. You know, a lot of times it's trivial, like I just stated. Oh, man, you just... You need to go out and get laid or you need to go out and get drunk or, you know, and they, they don't they don't really understand the depth of it. Or maybe they judge you or maybe they, they see it as weak or so a lot. I think a lot of times there's there's hesitation on people to reach out for help. And that's why they'll say, hey, I'm, I'm fine. Or, or or like you suggest, the opposite. No, I'm doing terrible. They're afraid to say that. You know. Jamie, what you've been on stage? Many of your friends are are musicians, famous. You know, filling up literally football stadiums. You know, with tens of thousands of people to play in front of. That rush that they must have going on stage must be so incredible. But when that rush ends, that crash has to be horrible for some of them. And you've probably seen that. Well, I fortunately, I 
I uh, I don't know that I've seen it like in the moment like that. I've never. I don't think I've ever witnessed that um, necessarily in the moment. I, I have had friends who had to go do a performance when they didn't. They weren't. They, they weren't having their best day. Let me put it that way. And um, but they go out and do their job and and uh, you know for the moment and then you know come off stage and and deal with real life um but i've never witnessed necessarily that that hardcore rise and crash in the moment i've seen it where you know i don't i don't i don't want to mention names but i i have a friend who's a a a rapper he's and um he's had his problems with drugs and um I, I would, you know, greet him, especially when he played Las Vegas. Um, I would usually greet him at the airport, drive him to the airport, and sometimes he'd stay at my house. But um, he, you know, for years was really, really into drugs. And um, how he performed each night, I really don't know, because when he wasn't performing, he could barely function. And uh, he just seemed to be miserable most of the time. Fortunately, he's clean now and he kicked it. And he's a much happier person, healthier person, and still doing his thing. So, you know, um, I, I, the, those who aren't fortunate enough to pull through it, it's, it's very sad. It's very sad. Well, let's turn the corner here and let's get a little happy because I'm a little angry right now because I didn't win the Canadian tickets for GNR playing live in Van- in uh, New York tonight from Sirius XM. I'm a little pissed off at that because, no offense, Jamie, I would boot you off the air for me to catch a GNR show in New York. I um, wouldn't blame you. Yeah, I, I'm, a little, <laughs> I'm a little cranky about that because I don't think we'll ever get the residency again like you and I got to experience down in Vegas a couple years ago. But moving on, because we're talking Rebel Planet, and people who have listened to you before, that you're always coming with some great news on what is happening around the world. And one of the big things that we wanted to get into today was the whole social media aspect. There's a lot of conspiracy, Jamie, around the social media aspect, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, whatever you may choose to use, that the the government and, more importantly, the alphabet agencies are using this to gain information on people, to gain facial recognition, and to gain personal information that people are just throwing out to the world right then and there. Is this something that you have studied up on, and what is your opinion of it? Uh, yeah, I have, actually. It's it's always been a, um, a concern of mine from the early days um, of kind of exploring the alternative and conspiracy theories and other things. Uh, and I, I, I was into that, and I was doing that way before the Internet came along. So when it did come along... Um, you know, it was kind of the natural conclusion of, oh boy, well, that's a lot of information to just be out there. Um, so um, my, my feeling on it is, is that it's sort of, on the one hand, something that just is. You know, we're going to have to deal with it. Um, people choose to live their lives online. They most pe- Most people choose to have some form of social media, whether it be, you know, Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram or or any of these other things that are out there, Twitter, and uh, even the president Twitters all the time now. So it's pretty much everybody pretty much has something, uh, some sort of online profile. Uh, Most people do some form of online uh, shopping so a lot of their their uh, you know financial information is out there. People do online banking, uh, online dating. <laughs> you know, everybody's out there, and um, so it's kind of one of those things that we we like. It's kind of a double edged sword. It it allows for a lot of convenience, but at the same time, there's a security risk in it, and there's an uh, anonymity risk in it, and a privacy risk, and 
As far as the networks and the social media sites themselves, I don't think that they have our best interest at heart, if that's the question. I don't think they care much about protecting our privacy. Uh, and as a matter of fact, um, I, I know for a fact that, that some of these agencies, these institutions, these businesses have contracts with each other. Um, and they do share information. Um, and a lot of times you'll hear that come out, but they don't just, they don't just throw it out there. Um, they, they try to give the presentation that, that, you know, like Facebook will try to paint a picture that they're trying to protect your privacy, but they're really not. Um, and they've been challenged on that. Mark Zuckerberg himself has been challenged on that before. I remember early on he did an interview with someone and he was challenged on that very question. And um, that video is probably still up on YouTube somewhere if you look it up. Mark Zuckerberg does a heated interview about privacy or something like that. And uh, when, when he was asked about the privacy issue, he literally started sweating, like visibly. Like He went from not sweating... So they ask that question to, to, to now just beads of sweat dripping off of him. And he had to, he, he even commented on it. He goes, whew, yeah. And, you know, it's, it's I, I think it's just a natural conclusion, as I stated earlier, that if something can be fallible, it probably will. Uh, I heard an interesting story the other day. I just happened to be watching, I, I, I'm not sure, I think it was Dateline, uh, Dateline was on and I think they had some program on about um, a murder suspect and they were trying to piece the whereabouts of this suspect together during the time of the murders and um, so the way the investigator explained it on the show was well we went to Google we went to Google and got a search warrant and and, uh, we were able to track their location through Google. And I thought, huh, I don't think it's ever really been put out there that Google, you know, not not your phone service, not the networks, but Google has the information of tracking you. Now, we, we know that they offer those services, certainly, but they seem to be the go-to for investigators. If, if if an investigator wants to know where you were and when you were there, they can just go to Google and find out. And, you know, I, I think it's a little more open than that. And I think I think the, the flow of information between certain agencies and um, services like that is probably a little more frequent than than we tend to think. Is this a mass cultivation of information by governments or the Bilderbergs or the Rothschilds or whoever it may be in the whole Illuminati Express medium? Is that where you think it's leaning or do you think this is just, you know, what we see trying to determine what advertisers work best? Because I'm going to be honest with you, Jamie, I do have some questions, but I'm curious to get your your thoughts on that first. Well, I, here's the thing. Um, there's there's such a larger picture to so many conspiracy theories um, that, and you and I have talked about this even on the show before, the term Illuminati, and you, you know that I, I stay away from that term because um, I don't believe there is a, an, an, an Illuminati per se. In other words, I don't think there's, there's not an organization running around nowadays referring to themselves as the Illuminati. Um, that, 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 that's my opinion and that, that my research has lent itself to that conclusion. There is, however, um, a group of people with what I would term sinister agendas and the, the names that people associate with those uh, conspiracies um, 
when they use terms like Illuminati. So a lot of those names and faces, sure, they're the same. Um, I, I just have a real problem with the term, the use of that term, because I know the historical use of that term, and I know why those people would not use that, and they would not collect themselves or assemble themselves um, in in anything referred to as the Illuminati for 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 any of those. Uh, supposed reasons. Having said all that, um, again, I look at these things more as a global issue. Uh, when I say global, I mean an overview. Um, and and when I do that, and I've done that over the years because everybody likes to attach things, and they like to put it together like one big puzzle. And they're like, oh, you know, all these puppet masters are connected, and this is all. And in, in a loose way. That's probably true in a loose way, Um, but it doesn't quite work that way. And so a lot of times when skeptics investigate conspiracy theories, um, they will come to the conclusions, well, we just can't connect the dots, so it's all crap. We don't believe it. And and there's some there's some validity in their conclusion, because you're not going to be able to connect all of the dots that readily. They're not going to fit that tightly. Um, that's not the way it works. There's a whole lot of players in what some would term as the new world order. What's as, you know, as we mentioned, some would call the Illuminati, uh, corporate, the corporate West, you know, the puppet masters, whatever you want to attach to the string pullers of the world, the powers that be, um, there there are people that work with agendas. There is absolutely no doubt about that. Um, there are people at work with agendas. And they do uh, incorporate and implore the uses of, of things like the media, social media, politicians, governments, laws. Whatever tools are at their means, um, if they can influence those and use those and buy those and manipulate those, they will and they have and they do. Um, but it's not it 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 it's not such a finely tool uh, fine finely tuned um, tight web as people think that it is. Uh, it often runs as if it were, um, but the biggest. Thing that I think that social media and the mainstream media, which is, I, I'd like to coin a phrase tonight if I can, I like to refer to the mainstream, mainstream media as the slipstream media, because they are, they are just getting hammered right now. They're really being taken to task for, um, for years of reporting things, fake stories, manufacturing stories, um, their political biases, and a a lot of them are really being taken to task, which I think is a great thing. And I think a lot of that, ironically, is a result of social media. A lot of that is a result of alternative news and alternative media. Uh, The Internet, you know, ironically... Like I said earlier, it's a double-edged sword. It, it it can be a bad thing, but then again, it can be a really good thing. And I think one of the things that it's done is, the, the most important thing that it's done, in my opinion, is giving everyone a voice. So we, we can all share information. We don't all have to get everything from just a few talking heads on a few corporate networks that are supported by a very small group of corporate elites. We can all share information openly, and I encourage that. And that's one of the main reasons that, uh, that, I'm, that I'm starting Rebel Planet News is for that reason. Jamie, one of the things that I have noticed, and I am going to be honest with you, for years, I never took notice in the idea that social media was tapped into. Whether it was by through the cell phone or on computer, I just had no idea that there was a correlation. You know, I was dumb to it, if, <coughs> if, if that makes any sense. Sure. And I'll tell you, in the last year, and I don't know what it is, but I've asked people 
around me if they've experienced this as well. And I'll ask you as well. And this is away from the radio show. So it's nothing that I have been bringing up here in the studio. Okay. But have you ever had it where all of a sudden you're like, you're thinking in your head at, say, 11 o'clock at night, man, I, I wish I should go to McDonald's for breakfast in the morning. And you get up in the morning and you haven't checked your phone all day, you haven't checked anything, and you wake up, and all of a sudden there's McDonald's advertisements all over your phone on Facebook or on Twitter. Have you had that happen? Uh, <laughs> you you said that you um, you were just dreaming of McDonald's. No, no, no. Let's let's say let's say for instance. Okay, like give you an example. This is this is something true. I was trying to give an example there. I'll give you something true that happened to me. My wife and I were looking for a truck. Yes. Okay. And we're mm-hmm. debating, you know, between the big three. We we decided to go uh, with a GMC Sierra. Okay. Right. Love it or hate it, whatever. Don't really care. We're not getting into the automotive debate here. Okay. It's an American brand. I have no problem with it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Built in Mexico. But that's okay. There you go. Exactly. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, but the whole point is as we were as we were um, looking all of a sudden, even though I haven't researched anything about the truck on my phone or on Facebook, one thing that I noticed was all of a sudden there's all these GM advertisements on my, you know, like if I look at Facebook on my phone or Twitter on mm-hmm. my phone or on my computer, all of a sudden there was, you know, GM advertisements popping right. up. Have you ever right. had that happen? Now, now, I, I just want to be clear before I answer. So you were just having a discussion with your wife. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you, you hadn't used your, your, your no. computer or your phone or anything to research mm-hmm. it. You just, you were having a discussion. Exactly. And Seth here, I'll give you an example from the chat room. Seth mm-hmm. in the chat room is saying, Dave, this happened to me today. He said, yes. I, I mentioned to the wife about doing the laundry, then all of a sudden I check my social media and an ad for gain detergent shows up. Yes, yes. Let, let me explain to you how that works, first of all, in, in, in general layman terms. Um, First of all, yes, that does happen, and yes, it has happened to me. And it happened early on during the smartphone revolution. Um, my buddy and I were talking about uh, going fishing. And like your experience, we I hadn't bothered looking online for any gear or anything like that. Uh, but it, it was a pretty good discussion. I think maybe... Uh, five, ten minute discussion. And it was just he and I, you know, sitting in the back porch, having a drink, quiet. And uh, sure, we had our cell phones sitting on the table. Um, And lo and behold, look at my phone a little while later. And just like you explained, there was ads for fishing vest and tackle boxes and rod and reels and fishing trips. And this went on for days that I was getting these advertisements and um, the way uh, now we we do know we do know that there's uh, algorithms that that work on the internet if you do happen to look something up on the internet or do a Google search and you look up a truck or you look up fishing gear um, your computer has something called cookies what that that you know, grab that information and then share that information. And uh, there's all kinds of ways that that information gets gets captured and then again redistributed. Um, It's not illegal to do that. And uh, a lot of companies do it a lot. And and all of the social media um, entities do it. In fact, that's where they make most of their revenue is from that kind of a thing. Um, but them listening to you is spooky because I think if, if they were to ask you, and here's the tricky part, they do ask you, they, they don't necessarily ask you, but they tell you when you go buy your phone from Sprint or any of these other companies, telecommunication companies, um, it's in the fine print. It is in there. 
and any of these services that you use. It's in the fine print. So if you read it, and nobody does, but if you read it, it's in there, that that information can and will be shared. Um, so unfortunately, what they're doing isn't illegal. Is it right? Mm, I don't think so. When it comes to things like if my cell phone is sitting on the table and I'm having a private conversation I don't think that it should be marketing my preferences or listening, quote unquote, listening to because there's not a person listening to you. Um, But we all know that your your cell phone can, for lack of a better word, understand what you're saying. Uh, If you've ever used Siri or any, I mean, you could pick up your phone, tap Siri and say, hi, Siri, uh, who was the, uh, you know, 36th president of the United States. Siri's going to know. She speaks your language. She, and she's going to answer you in your language of choice. So the technology is there to process your voice and know the words you're using and then send that information out into the world and come back with something to sell. Um, now, we know that they're using that for marketing. And again, it is, it is in the fine print that they can do that. Um, unfortunately Um, what I don't think anybody would sign off on is being able to use that technology um, against you in some incriminating way some would argue well if you're not doing anything wrong you shouldn't worry about that Um, yeah you should worry about that Um, there has to be a line drawn somewhere when it comes to privacy so I, I, I have a real problem with some of these technologies personally you know that my personal opinion i understand that it may be in the fine print saying that they could use your voice but with that microphone being continuously on does that not give anybody the opportunity to listen to you besides siri or whoever else in trying to pick up key words on what you were listening to to pass off to google or facebook or twitter Sure. And I don't know that it's continuously on. I, I, that's, uh, that's part of the technology that I don't necessarily understand. I don't know. Um, I don't know what activates that, but your, your experience, I, you know, I know you to be of sound mind and, uh, speaking for myself, I, I'm not making up that story about the fishing gear that, that was in, That was pretty spooky to me personally. I'm sure it was for you and your truck experience. Um, So I I don't I don't think it's ironic. I I do believe I absolutely believe that somehow or another my device picked up my conversation about fishing and tried to sell me fishing gear. Um, I don't know that the mic is like consistently on or if it's activated by a certain decibel level or if it's a a random thing i don't i don't know how that works all i know is that i wasn't even using my phone when that happened it was just sitting on the table i don't know what your experience was with the truck but um and my story and your story aren't the only ones i've heard like that uh i've heard dozens of stories like that uh so i i feel like like that is going on uh, we know that it's going on when you're doing searches um and so i don't know i i i don't know how i feel about it in a, in a, a normal search um i guess that's fair I, I feel really creeped out about some uh, a device processing my personal space when i'm not interacting with the device by choice that's that's a problem for me Jamie, we only have about two and a half minutes here before we got to go to our first break. Do you then recommend to people, from what you have learned from your sources regarding this, do you then recommend to people to continually turn their phones off, which I'm going to say 99.8% of us don't on a normal basis? Or do you recommend that you just watch what you say if you're around your any type of recording device? You know, I don't think that I'm qualified to really even offer advice in that respect. I think that, um, you know, I, I don't think anybody would really get in the habit of turning off their phone. Having a cell phone has become a, a modern convenience. And 
you know, having to remember to turn it on and off for the sake of privacy puts the onus on, on, on us. And I don't think that we should really be tasked with that. I, I, I think if we're collectively concerned about that, we need to be more active in, um, you know, holding these, these companies to task and fighting for our privacy rights and, and demanding that they do things a little differently if, 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 if they are indeed uh, randomly listening in through our devices. Uh, and and I, I know they are, uh, you know, we're talking casually about this, but it goes much deeper than that. Um, you know, you're, they, can, they can view you on your cameras. Your TV can actually be reversed and watch you watching it. Um, there's all kinds of technology out there that can be used to quote unquote spy if someone wanted to use those tools to do that. And I, I don't I don't think that's fair game. I I didn't sign up for that. Just because I want a cell phone to talk to people in my life doesn't mean that I want someone I don't know listening to what I'm saying, even if it is a robot. I don't want my television watching me just because I'm watching it. You know, I didn't sign up for that. So, at least pay you for it. I mean, that's that's <laughs> you know, pay me for my entertainment. If I'm entertaining whoever is watching, like the cameras on my computer or my phone or listening in, I I reserve the right to charge you. That's all I'm <laughs> going to say. All I'm right. going to say about that. Jamie, you you hold on here because we're going to go to break here momentarily. Jamie Sexton from the Rebel Planet News comes on the third Thursday of every month here on Spaced Out Radio. We do this show once a month because Jamie comes in as our local conspiracy theorist, alternative media source, and we break down everything that is going on on a monthly basis. Now, his website, rebelplanetnews.com, is in the works of be building. It should be done by the end of 2017. We're looking forward to it because we're going to be hooking up with him. He's going to be hooking up with us. It's going to be a great tandem indeed. You're listening to Space Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. We'll be back right after this break. Coming September 29th to October 1st, the first annual Spaced Out Radio Caribou Paracon. Hi, this is Dave Scott. The event will be held at the Spruce Hill Spawn Resort in 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia. Come join us for an amazing weekend of speakers talking all things paranormal, UFOs, ghosts, aliens, Sasquatch, intuitiveness. Listen to great speakers like Miriam Delicato, Samantha Mowat, and the crypto guru Ronald Murphy. Get your VIP passes by going to spacedoutradio.com and clicking on the Paracon banner. Come to BC, where the paranormal is waiting for you. From coast to coast to coast, Black Light Uncharted is taking on the paranormal across Canada. From ghostly hauntings to the UFOs flying above in conjunction with MUFON Canada, they're closely investigating what's going on in the northern skies and checking out the apparitions that walk among us. Check out our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. We want to know your thoughts, we want to hear your experiences, and we want you to share your stories. The answers are out there, and we intend to find them. Would you like to become one of our space travelers? All you have to do is click on the space travelers icon at spacedoutradio.com. For only $5 a month, you can get access to some great prizes, as well as private monthly shows, newsletters, and a members-only section on our website. Become a space traveler today. It's paranormal news at its finest. Welcome to The Encounter. At spaceoutradio.com, The Encounter Online is SOR's trusted news source for everything weird and strange going on around the world. This is news editor Eric Markham. Our team of journalists are scouring the planet for those strange stories that rarely make the mainstream. No fear-mongering or fake news here. Head over to spaceoutradio.com and encounter The Encounter. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy in your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? Have you had an experience you can't explain? Had a run-in with ghosts, maybe Bigfoot, or seen lights in the sky? 
Hi, I'm Mike Schmidt from the SOR Sight Lines. I'm here to investigate your sighting. Head to spacedoutradio.com and fill out a report on the sight lines. All your information is 100% confidential and I will help you figure out what you've been seeing. File your report and let's find out the answers together. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There. You will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us, from radio commercials to banners and social media. Have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. Have you got your Cosmic Passport? If you need one, tune in to Cosmic Passport on Spaced Out Weekend. This is Elizabeth Anglin, ET experiencer, spirit medium, and host of Cosmic Passport. Each weekend, I'll be bringing you interviews and support from other paranormal experiencers and the best in intuitive spiritual guidance from across the globe. It's all happening starting at 9 p.m. Pacific Time, midnight Eastern, on spacedoutradio.com. From British Columbia to Northern California, Pacific North Weird has Cascadia covered. Check out our feature videos at spacedoutradio.com, where I... Vincent Zunza and my super sleuth partner Alexandra Sullivan track down the weird and strange stories from around the Pacific Northwest, from Bigfoot to Mel's Hole and everything in between. This is what makes life exciting. So why report the normal when we can report the Pacific North Weird? Right here at spacedoutradio.com. Oh, there's only one way to rock, loud and proud. In high definition, Radio 702 Rocks, Las Vegas. Every Saturday and Sunday night, as Dave Scott wanders aimlessly in the wilderness, you can come hang out with me, James Tyson, and Spaced Out Weekend. Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, I'll take you along as we talk with some of the best experts in their fields. SpacedOutRadio.com is the place to find us. So sit down, relax, put your feet up, enjoy the topics like the paranormal, supernatural, intuitiveness, and so much more. Hope to see you there. Don't have time to listen to Spaced Out Radio Live? Wherever you are, the car, the office, the shower, or even if you're traveling, we're right here for you. Each Spaced Out Radio show can be found on iTunes, TuneIn, and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's the perfect way for you to catch up on our shows. For more information, just head over to our website, spacedoutradio.com, and tune in to us today. The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio. Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. And hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Welcome back to the second hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Great to have you with us. Tomorrow night on the program, we're going to have a very interesting topic indeed. Dave Schock is going to join us. We're going to talk about a satellite program that he is helping build called Q4Sat Disclosure. Or pardon me, CubeSat 4 Disclosure. And they are going to be sending up a satellite later this summer out of the Mojave Desert, strictly looking for UFOs. 
It's a three-month program. Dave is going to be with us at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spaceoutradio.com. We want to welcome in everyone listening in on WQEE 99 Rock the Key down in Noonan, Georgia, home of the Walking Dead. We are live as well on the United Public Radio Network, 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. Thank you for being with us. We're live on KTLK, The Fringe FM, Renegade Talk Radio out of Las Vegas. And if you're listening in on Revolution Radio, remember the Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Head on over to freedomslips.com and donate today. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Kaifa Rhinos. Kaifa Rhinos is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, Space Travelers, as Bill sets a password each and every night right here on the Mighty SOR. If you want to follow us on social media, you can do so on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio to connect with me live during the show as well. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can follow us on Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. You can listen to us on iHeartRadio in the United States. Tune in iTunes, and our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including joining the SOR Space Travelers Club for 5 bucks a month, read up on the encounter online, watch some great videos from UFO seekers Tim Doyle, we got a store as well where you can pick up t-shirts, stickers, posters, Paracon tickets, we got it all. And we're going to be bringing more to you, indeed, in the near future. Tonight, the third Thursday of every month, we do a feature called The Rebel Planet with Jamie Sexton from Rebel Planet News out of Las Vegas. And we talk everything conspiracy, media, alternative, whatever it is, is where we go. Jamie, welcome back. Yes, sir. Good to be here. Absolutely, my friend. Absolutely. Now, right before the break, we were talking about social media, and we got into the whole voice recognition thing, but Snapchat is now doing a feature where you can actually do facial recognition. Is this taking things on the privacy level a little too far for, say, government people who are looking for for evidence on whom you might be? Because there's a lot of people out there who who may not want their faces put on a computer of a government alphabet website. Yeah, again, I I think it's one of those areas where it becomes a double-edged sword. On On the one side, you know, we see it as, oh, that's a neat tool. We could use that for something, meaning us, the user. You know, that's great. Uh, We could use it. We think of it in terms sometimes like, like oh great we could use that to protect our privacy you know maybe maybe uh maybe i somebody won't be able to access my device if they're not me because you know i can they won't be able to log on my computer if it's not my face or we 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 we, we tend to think in terms of oh wow that's a neat gadget and it is and it can be used in neat ways um on the other hand, I, I'm always cautious and I'm always concerned about how it can be misused. And, you know, you can kind of theorize and hypothesize that if something can be used in the negative, it probably is or will be at some point. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know how I feel about it. Um, I, it, it, it. You know, if we were given a choice to say... You know, we as a public would not like this technology used um, to spy on us. Um, I, I think I think I would like to think that the majority of us would say uh, would, would be in agreement that we wouldn't like that. So, and then you could, but you could always look at it from the other side of the coin too, and say, you know, if you had a child that was kidnapped or something. You know, in that moment of crisis or that moment of, of panic and concern, you know, you'd want every technology available, you know, to at, at your disposal. You know, amber alerts, facial facial recognition, you know, any anything possible if you were the victim of a crime. Um, so you have to consider all angles with these sort of things, but. but 
you know, for me, I just feel like privacy is something that we at at at, at every opportunity we should try to pro- try our best collectively and individually to protect our privacy. And we need to I think we really need to be more diligent about that, more active about that. That's it's always been a concern of mine. Is it an invasion of privacy or is it just something that they're hiding once again behind the very famous word of the last 15 years or words of the last 15 years, which is Homeland Security? Well, um, that's a whole nother can of worms. I think that, you know, after 9-11, um, we had the induction of the, uh, the the Patriot Act and all sorts of other legislation that came to uh, came to bear that that I believe my own personal feeling um, and research has led me to the conclusion that a lot of these things really are an invasion of our privacy, and they are uh, um, they've taken away a lot of, a lot of liberties, at least in the form of legislation. By that, I mean that <clears throat> there are new laws on the books that, in my opinion, violate the rights given to us in our constitution. Now, a lot of those laws, ironically, are not necessarily being enforced. So we're sort of living under the umbrella or under the perception that nothing has changed because we don't see it. We don't necessarily see um, the repercussions of some of these far-reaching uh, legislations and, and laws and things that have have changed since 9-11 and, and uh, since then. Um, but, you know, there's all kinds, of, there's all sorts of things that have um, infringed upon due process of law and the rights of a citizen. And, uh, you know, for, for example, to give you a specific example, um, a federal officer does not need a warrant to come into your home. They don't. They don't need that. Since since the Patriot Act, they don't need that. They can just come into your home without a warrant, search your home, arrest you, detain you, and even imprison you without a charge, without seeing a magistrate, and they can hold you indefinitely. And that's on the books. Those laws are on the books. Um, you don't see it every day, so we're not really alarmed as a public. You know, we're not we're not paying attention to it. We don't see it as a threat. And some people are skeptical about that. They're like, "Is that true?" Do your research. Look it up. Um, read the Patriot Act. It's online. You can actually read it if you care to read it. And if you are, if you're like me and you care about your personal freedoms, you, you would be alarmed. You would be worried about uh, things like that. Um, we live in a society that, that perpetuate, you know, you and I have talked a lot about um, things like fear, fear mongering and uh, things like that. And I know that you've, you've made that charge, um, you know, responsibly, because uh, I know you to be a responsible person, but you've made that charge responsibly against the idea of alternative media, although you and I are both in the business of alternative media. Um, and it's a legitimate concern. But, you know, politicians, in my opinion, politicians and mainstream media uh, are actually the biggest fear mongers in the world. And you know they they can put out something the only thing is we don't see it as fear mongering because they're wearing the suit and they're wearing the uniform and they've got the title so any fear mongering that comes out of them we see as a legitimate crisis you know what i mean we're we're like well that's coming from a quote unquote official source um but you know w- through those means through the media and hysteria and things they, they can sort of implant a feeling of insecurity into society. And when you do that, um, you, uh, when you do that, 
you influence society in a way that they may be willing to give up more of their securities and more of their rights than they would normally do. For example, after 9-11, everybody was ready to do strip searches at the airport. I don't care. I'll strip down. I have nothing to hide. Um, you know, and everybody signed up. They were willing to give up their rights. They were willing to not carry full tubes of toothpaste on the airplane and strip search grandma and strip search little five-year-old Sally. You know, go for it. Whatever keeps us safe, you know, because they created that fear among uh, people um, with, with the constant theme of terrorism, 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 terrorism. And we just wanted to protect ourselves, you know. So, Jamie, I, wanna, ha- I, I just want to say something right there because I want to yeah. get this thought out. When I went to the Provincetown Paracon, I accidentally put my shampoo and my hair gel in my carry-on rather than my checked bag. So I get pulled to the side, you know, my bag gets scanned. What is this? What is this? I said, well, throw them out. I really don't care. It's shampoo and hair gel. You know, right. you know, but here's the thing that I found very ironic. I had two Bic lighters in my jacket pocket, walked right through. I put them, you know, before you go through the, the, the metal detector, you put them in that little gray compartment that you go through the slider. Not right. even not even worried about it. Now, five or six years ago, when I would go, I would I always when I go to Las Vegas, I always fly out of Washington State because the flights are much cheaper. And Google they, knows that. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. And and they would throw out our our lighters because you couldn't carry a lighter on board. Now they Makes allow sense. now they allow you a, a lighter to come if you're a smoker or you're just somebody who carries a lighter. You're allowed to carry a lighter on the plane, but you're not allowed hair gel. Right. It's ridiculous. I don't get it. Yeah. It, it, you know, there, there's a lot of bizarre sort of, um, you know, contradictions and ironies with a lot of these, a lot of this policy. Um, and, 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 you know, the TSA is, is just, you know, first of all, the TSA to me is just a really sloppy organization, really sloppy. And, um, you know, I mean, they're, they're bureaucracy, they're a government agency. So obviously, you know, you're going to get lazy people in there and they, they, their jobs are monotonous and they don't really have a lot of respect for, uh, the public. And, um, I've heard story after story after story, just countless stories of, of people being groped and strip searched and having their property taken and, detained and missing their flights and all sorts of stories um, due to the uh, TSA looking out for our best interest. And uh, to be honest, I, I, I just don't see, I you know, I mean, um, I don't think I've heard of any stories where they've prevented anything uh, to date. In fact, I remember um, I was out with some friends on tour um, I don't know where we went, but we 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 had a few uh, layovers in the flight, and um, and one of our stops in the layover, the uh, one of one of the the crew members for the tour whispered to me. He goes, "Dude," because we we were at a layover. We were at the airport for a few hours waiting for the next plane. He says, "Man, I." Uh, he goes, I, "I don't know if I should." Uh, I think I need to throw this away. I go, throw what away? He goes, man, he goes, I, I didn't mean to, but in my backpack, I have a, I had a box cutter. And I said, you had a box cutter? He goes, yeah. He goes, I use it on my job. He goes, you know, but he said, I didn't mean to bring it, but it's on. I go, yeah, t- you need to throw that away. He goes, yeah, I didn't throw it away. He goes, damn, I just bought it too. But I'm thinking to myself, you know, how good are these guys at their job that they didn't pick that up in the metal detector? You know what I mean? Like, how, how good are they really do, protecting anyone anyway? I mean, isn't a box cutter what the 
what what caused 9-11 in the first place. You had nine guys with box cutters or 19 guys, you know. So <clears throat> I don't know. I, I just feel like my, my feeling is, again, you know, I tend to look at things in a, a, a global picture, a bigger picture. And I think that <clears throat> sometimes – I think it was Thomas Jefferson that said uh, – um, I, I, I don't know if it was Thomas Jefferson, but one one of those, you know, statesmen uh, made a comment once that um, he who gives up uh, his freedoms in the interest of safety deserves neither freedom or safety. Um, and I, I, I think that's true to a, a degree. I think that's true to a degree. I don't think that I, I think that we there are ways to be more diligent about diligent about our own safety and our travel habits and things like that. And some of those things I think are reasonable. But overall, I think we need to be really, really careful about assuming that um, that any government institution would necessarily have our best interest at heart, especially when they're making new laws. I, I think that we as a public need to be more active and not wait around for the government to play mommy and daddy and 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 you know take care of us that way we need to be more responsible and 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 one of the responsible things that we need to do is is protect our own rights you know know your rights so many people don't know their rights they don't know their rights in in their financial behavior they don't know their rights in their own community say with with authority figures like police and and those sort of things they don't know their rights when they go to court they don't know their rights when they travel they just they don't know them and i think that's important because rights are valuable people before us generations before us fought for those rights and died for those rights so we could have them and we should protect them we you know, we, that's that's part of our responsibility is to look out for that. Because if we don't, believe me, someone somewhere, sometime will be motivated to take them back away from us. No, it is ridiculous because it makes you wonder, what are they trying to protect us from? Okay? If, you, if you're allowing little bottles of hair gel... You know, and you can have, say, 10 of those, but you can't have the big bottle that forms the same amount. It does get a little ridiculous. So I'm in the same agreement with you as someone, you know, I once again, I know people, I've, I've done it myself, carried a Bic lighter onto a plane. I think fire on a plane is a hell of a lot more dangerous than hair gel. Now, granted, they'll say, well, the hair gel can be used because of the alcohol in it can be used for an explosion. You know, great, fine and dandy. I'm still carrying something that could light things on fire, you know? Sure, sure. If you take a lighter on a plane, uh, you know, I think it's perfectly reasonable to assume that if you were motivated to do so, you could light the f seat in front of you on fire or those little, uh, you know, newspapers they give you in the, in the airplane. You could, you know, of course, you could set the carpet on fire. They sell alcohol on the plane. So I'm sure you could... Set that on fire. So, um, I mean, but 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 that you know you you could you could hypothesize all day long about well we could do this to make ourselves safer or we could do this to make ourselves safer and you could do that to the point where you probably just shouldn't get on the airplane. You know, <laughs> it's just um, at some point we've got to we've got to recognize that. There is no absolute way to guarantee your safety um, at every juncture. There just isn't. And I think that law on top of law on top of law and regulation on top of regulation is not the answer. I don't think it ever was the answer. And at the end of the day, you're going to turn around and realize, huh, I don't really feel any safer and now I have no rights and traveling is very inconvenient and crossing the road is very inconvenient. And now I've got 30 institutions taxing me for their very existence and making life difficult. So I, I just think that we need to really kind of look at this in, in a, a broader picture and think about what's most important and balance out our freedoms with, with reasonable 
ways to solve solutions instead of drastic ways that really don't work anyway. Well, Joel brings up a very, very good point, and I'm going to say it in a very way in jest. He goes, but if you really wanted to take down an airliner, couldn't you just open the emergency escape hatch inside? Seriously, there's a way to do it. Yeah, there's always a way to do it. You know, um, n- not to get into the whole gun debate, but I, I'm a, you know, I, I, I like guns. Uh, I support our Second Amendment. So I, I have no problem with weapons. And um, it's the same argument with that. I've never seen one single gun law ever that was going to prevent someone who wanted to do harm to somebody save a life. Even if there were no guns in existence, if I wanted to kill somebody and I was motivated to commit that crime, I could use a knife, a butter knife, a spoon, a rake, a chainsaw, anything I want. If you know what I mean, it does. It's it's just an instrument. At the end of the day, it's just an instrument, and it's the same thing with with the uh, like like your uh, your guest your uh, your listener suggest. Um, if you wanted to take down an airline, I'm sure you could find all kinds of ways to do it that uh, that that the TSA doesn't protect you from. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And when it comes to flying, recently, as early as yesterday, now the TSA and border security is cracking down on flights for Canadians and Mexicans coming into the United States almost harder than they were on flights coming from Europe, the Middle East, and Asia now. What is the beef with this? I mean, seriously, what has Canada ever done to the United States that is going to screw you guys up? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm unfamiliar with this. What, as, of, mind as, of, as, of, as of yesterday, they are making stricter searches on people entering the United States via airports so mm-hmm. f- who are flying in from Canada to the U.S. and Mexico into the United States. And right. those rules and regulations are now said to be stronger than those who are flying in from Europe, Asia, the Middle East, or wherever. Really? So, yes. do you, are you aware of what these new regulations may be? Because I, I, I haven't, I haven't heard this. I'm going to try and bring it up. So, but I mean, it, as I'm doing that, Jamie, it does get a little re, re, uh, ridiculous that <clears throat> the seclusion of what they are trying to do with the United States. You know, it it not only affects flights, but it affects businesses, tourism, it affects trade laws, you know, whether it's free trade, the NAFTA, whatever it is, you're getting into a lot of issues when you start clamping down on people who are just trying to visit maybe family. I have family in Vegas. I got friends there. I got right. fa- family on the East Coast and friends on the East Coast I would love to visit. But if you right. make it impossible, you know... Right. It just gets a little ridiculous at times. I agree, and it, it just it 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 um, you know it lends itself to what we're talking about. It's it's just I think that you know this is something that was uh, a concern of mine decades ago, and I would tell people I go yeah, but you know one of these days you know we won't be able to do this, and one of the and they were like oh you know you know people like to laugh off conspiracy theories. I don't really like to refer to them as conspiracy theories, but theories put forth that someone may not have your best interest at heart. You know what I mean? Someone may be trying to make a buck off of you at your inconvenience or your livelihood. And, you know, as time plays out, we learn that humanity hasn't really changed in thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Human beings can be sinister creatures and you know just because something comes in the form of a law doesn't mean necessarily that it's in your best interest and it can go a lot farther than making your life just inconvenient um but yeah i think we need to be diligent about these things i mean um you know but you know we live in one of these we live in a time right now um where especially in the united states uh 
politi- uh, politics is really heated, as, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, and um, I, I think that's a good thing. Um, I think it's, I, I, you know, socially, I think it's a tinderbox. I think we, we have a lot of uh, potential for pockets of bad things happening because a lot of people uh, are really emotional about um, politics and, and, and those sorts of things. And you've even seen instances um, on the news of people fighting and attacking each other and people getting shot and all kinds of things like that, which I think is terrible. But on the other hand, people are engaged. Um, unfortunately, they're only engaged in a really trivial level, superficial level. It's, it's more of a, um, a, a surface investment into politics, you know, and everybody has their brand of bias. Um, but, you know, at least at least they're engaged and hopefully a lot more people will turn that into a real investment start really giving a crap about laws and their society and how things work and what are these politicians really up to and you know uh w- one of the things that i find really ironic about all of this heated uh, uh political stuff that's going on in the u.s right now is that Everybody will pick their good guys and they'll pick their bad guys, meaning politicians. And they'll say, well, yeah, but your guy did this and your guy did this. And it's like, okay, but your guy did this. And it's a back and forth thing. What they don't realize is that maybe the whole system is corrupt. And it's really not about your guy or my guy or what party did you vote for or what party did I vote for or I don't like this guy's hair or I don't like this guy's style or this, that or the other thing. I think we really just need to get out from under that that uh, predetermined dichotomy. What I think is a stage dichotomy. I think I think the media and Washington – and we talked earlier about the powers that be, I think they often count on us being at odds. They like it. It's good for their business. It's good for their policy. Um, And they can always kick the football down the road together and, and just use one side against the other, and their agenda just keeps moving forward. Because as long as they make you think that, You've got a guy on your side in the fight, in other words, the guy you elected for. As long as you believe that, it doesn't matter if his policies that you voted for actually go forward or not. You feel like someone's there for you. So you keep falling for the show and you and you keep fighting amongst each other while Washington just laughs behind the curtain and keeps doing what they're doing anyway. You know what I mean? Um like, for example, um, the Republican Party, most of the Republican uh, politic, uh, p- politicians who got elected over the past few terms were elected uh, because they can they were either elected or reelected because they campaigned on the idea of repeal and replace Obamacare. Now I'm talking about the Republicans right now. But now they had an opportunity to do something about it, and they all just drop the ball. No matter which side of the aisle you're on, I'm just stating the facts. They they didn't do anything about it. They got nothing done. They control the House, they control the Senate, and they've got the White House. If they wanted to create a new policy, and they've had years and years to do that, if they had something better, this would be their time. I I would argue that they don't want to replace it because they were in on it. I think all of Washington is corrupt, and I've had a hunch for years and years and years that both sides of the aisle just put on a show. It's like wrestling. We've talked about this before, where two wrestlers will get in front of the microphone and get in front of the camera, and you know they act like the worst enemies in the world, and I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to destroy you, and after the match they go out to dinner together because it's just a show and I think Washington in a large part works the same way getting to those flight regulations Jamie this came down two days ago so 
Canadian and Mexican passengers now, according to Air Canada and WestJet here in Canada, our two major airlines, will now be subjected to the exact same travel uh, restrictions, or not really restrictions, pardon me, screenings, pardon me, of what other uh, people from the Middle East will be going through as well. So we have heightened screenings of personal electronic devices, more canine screenings in the use of whatever they call advanced technology, increased security protocols around planes and passenger areas, and in general, some extra overall passenger screening. However, unlike passengers traveling from several Middle Eastern countries, passengers flying from Mexico and Canada were not first subjected to a ban on carrying laptops and other electronic devices on board before this new round of regulations rolled out as of two days ago. So basically, now they're saying, well, everybody north and south is harboring terrorism or terrorists. I mean, hell, we just paid one off ten and a half million bucks, so I guess we are. But, uh, you know, what do you do? What do you do? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, again, I, I it, it's really hard to say, you know, who's making these decisions to to loosen restrictions, tighten restrictions, and who should we tighten them on? You know, I don't know. I, I You know, I, I've thought so many times, so many times in my lifetime, the thought has occurred to me. And with the Internet, it may be more possible than ever, but why don't we get to vote on issues? Instead of, instead of voting for a candidate, that is supposed to go to his, you know, designated uh, post and make, you know, thousands of decisions for us just because we cast one vote or two if you vote in the uh, in the midterms. But but why should we put that stake in politicians? Why don't you know the systems exist nowadays? Why can't we vote on particular issues? And, and you know, and then I, I think there would be less chance for things being, uh, you know, rigged. In that, you know what I mean? Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know that we need politics. They're kind of like a middleman that really doesn't. Maybe not. Maybe they're not necessary anymore. You know what I mean? With maybe that's one of the ways in tech, in, way, in, in one of the ways in which technology could serve us instead of working against us is. Uh, you know, putting facilities in place where, where we can go and actually vote. Now, you can do that on some propositions and things when it comes voting time. Are you going to vote for, you know, this proposition or that proposition? But, we, we, you know, that's just a handful of things. You know, overall, we really don't get to vote on, on a lot of the big ticket items. Uh, and, and we don't get enough of a voice in that. Uh, um, so, you know, we're always free to call our congressman or call our senator or call these officials, but people really don't get engaged like that. They really don't. True, I understand that, but at some point, Jamie, I mean, with 9-11 being 15, 16 years ago, 15 and a half years ago now, at some point, the paranoia has to end. The paranoia, it has to, though, because what you're doing is you're turning... You're using the word defense and patriotism the same way communism was formed. Absolutely, but they're using a more important word, and that's the one why. Well, that's why I was saying no. They're using the word terrorism, and you know I, I've always had a real problem with that term terrorism. I mean, that that's such a general term, and. It doesn't really define an enemy. It doesn't really define an objective. You know, it's like uh, it's like the war on drugs. It's like, what does that really mean? You know, uh, it, it really it's too vague. It's you know, when you say terrorism, it's like why don't you say war on the terrorist? Define your enemy. If you're really out to defeat. A certain group of people, um, you know, this term terrorism is a really strong psychological uh, die to cast in the waters, and it's big business. 
as long as terrorism exists in the world, you can justify all of these different, you know, wars that you have going on simultaneously in the world where you don't really know what your objective is and, you know, you, you kill one bad guy or one bad group and another group pops up and, you know, this thing goes on for decades and decades and decades and you don't even really officially declare war. You know, the United States has since... Uh, since the Korean War, the United States has not officially ever declared war on anyone since then. That includes Vietnam, that includes uh, all of the Middle Eastern wars. Um, we haven't officially declared war on anyone. That doesn't seem right to me. That seems scandalous to me. And I think when you're going to go to war and you're going to risk the lives of our soldiers and you're going to risk casualties wherever you're fighting and, and all the things, all the byproducts of war, I think that you should define your enemy. You should define your objective and that there needs to be more uh, accountability in that. This word terrorism has been this dark cloud that the media in Washington and, and everybody just throws over the public, not just, not just here in the U.S., but you know, around the world. People love it. Governments love it because they can keep funding wars and taxing people for it and justifying whatever it is they're doing where they're doing it. Uh, don't get me wrong. I know that there are radical uh, extremists uh, in the world um, from all po all pockets of, of society. And I know there are people out there who mean to do others harm. I'm, I'm not suggesting that there aren't. What I'm saying, though, is that there's just a, a really vague overtone to a lot of these things that go on. And one of the casualties in this terrorism stigma happens to be our freedoms um, and again it's all fear they say terrorism 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 and we all panic and go whatever we got to do we'll give up our lighters we'll give up our toothpaste we'll take off our shoes you know yada 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 and whatever law they pass we're just supposed to just accept it because they're looking out for our safety yet I don't think that one single terrorist, as far as I'm aware, has been caught since 9-11 through all of these means. I, I, I don't think so. There's been some incidents that have happened. Like, for example, there's been a few bombings in London where after the fact, after they carried out their deeds um, and, 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 you know, there were casualties, the news reported Officials have had their eyes on these people for months or years. It's like, what do you mean you had your eyes on them? They still did what they did. If you had the, your eyes on them, why didn't you prevent it? I mean, what are we doing? Why, if, you can, if you can listen to my phone and you can know what I'm searching for and my television can watch me and I have to take off my clothes at the airport and they're making travel restrictions harder for you and harder for people from Mexico to get in. If they're doing all of this, why don't they catch these people or stop these people that they've had their eyes on? How effective is all this? To me, it, it, it kind of it begs the question, are they really looking out for us or are they just trying to tighten down on us? Well, it is like herding the sheep, Jamie. The more you can make people diverse in their thoughts and what they are allowed to do, the more you are breaking down their own personal freedoms. Absolutely. If, if you and I were at opposite sides of a political spectrum and we're debating it and debating it and debating it, it really doesn't matter what the powers be are doing, powers that be are doing. It doesn't matter... If you vote for a guy based on what on the campaign trail he says he's going to do and you're like, you know what? I like that. I'm behind that. 
and you're not you're not worried about his personality you're not worried about his hairstyle you're not worried about his ethnicity you're not worried if it's a man or a woman you're not worried about any of that you just you stand behind and you support the ideas that this candidate is putting forward and you care enough as a citizen to vote for that person and they get elected and then the next thing you know, you turn around and there's all you see on the news. One network is biased this way. The other network is biased that way. And you have all these you have all these guest speakers on and all these politicians on and everybody's at every at each other's throat. Right. And that in turn influences the public. So these people stand around the water cooler at their respective positions in the world and argue amongst themselves because they're just carrying out. It's an extension of the argument they saw on the news the night before. Yeah, but did you see on this network this? And did you see on network your guy did this? Why? You know, and, and some of that can be healthy. But on the other hand, if it's just bickering and just bickering, do we ever really stop to realize that we, we've taken our, and, and all that bickering, we've really kind of taken our eye off the people that are supposed to be doing the job. So they'll serve their two years, their four years, their eight years or whatever their term may be. And nothing gets done. And we don't really turn around and hold anybody accountable because life goes on in that cycle. And I think from a social point standpoint and from a psychological standpoint, that's kind of the, the, the system we're caught up in. It's kind of like a, a, a reality show in a way or like the Truman Show. And we're kind of caught up in it. We don't even really realize that, that that's happening to us. And, and on, on the one hand, we feel invested because we feel passionate about our quote unquote positions. You know, we feel like we're invested because we watch, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes of news a day. We feel like we're informed when we're really not. And the other side feels like they're informed. So you go at it and you battle and you, you actually, you know, sometimes your, your feelings get hurt or you lose friendships or, you know, this, that or the other thing. But we're too worried about all those social influences that we don't really stop to go, wait, I think we're both getting played. And I think that nothing's getting done. And the only thing that I do see that's moving forward is that the reins are getting tighter and tighter and tighter and we're in the, the the boxes that we live in in terms of laws and regulations and taxes and fees and things like that are getting smaller and the boxes those boxes are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller in other words those cages and we're we're not really paying attention to that we're you know and and when you when someone does start to point that out you know, then the argument can be made, well, what if you're not doing anything wrong, you shouldn't worry about that. Or, you know, and, you know, people always have, they want to argue that, you know, that, well, life doesn't really feel different. Well, no, because these things are a slow grind. They happen over decades. And it's a slow marching agenda towards, you know, more and more regulation and less and less freedoms. And I think that this is something that I've witnessed over my lifetime happening, and I'm very passionate about it. That's one of the, again, that's one of the motivators for starting Rebel Planet News is because I want to make people aware of not only the things that are happening in the world, but who may be behind it and what's really going on. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of that's being done right now. I think a lot of these news networks are being called to task for for being propaganda machines and for being, um, you know, being uh, on the take and manipulating the stories to move society in one direction or another. Jamie, is it too much of a control substance by the military-industrial complex that keeps this fear going? Because as long as there's fear, there's going to be weapons made. I read one stat today. The United States military, the Air Force, I believe, paid $1.6 billion for three brand-new unmanned drones to drop ordnance. Yet it would only cost $1.3 billion to replace the disgusting and contaminated flint water system absolutely that's i mean listen you follow the money um and and that's another byproduct of of this stigma of terrorism and fear around the world is that you know it's just justification 
for uh, spending more and more and more in terms of the industrial uh, military industrial complex. Um, but I, you know, and I, you know, it, it's it's you don't want to get it. You never want to get into the business of presuming everything that's going on in the world. Um, I don't spend my time in Afghanistan and Iraq talking to the locals or to the soldiers and everything else. So I, I do, I try to responsibly caution myself against presumably knowing everything that's going on in the world and criticizing it to, to its final end. But I will say that I, I know that we, you know, the stigma of terrorism and the fact that it's been used to further, um, you know, these wars around the world is probably far exceeded its shelf life, far exceeded its shelf life. I mean, I, I, I think we've been fighting now over in, in different parts of the Middle East for since before Bush won, you know, left office. I mean, these are decades of wars that supposedly the most powerful military in the world, the United States, we haven't been able to, we haven't been able over decades with all of our billions and trillions of dollars worth of military assets, we haven't been able to root out so-called terrorists who live in mud huts and drive goats back and forth to work. They don't even have electricity and running water are you kidding me i mean th this angers me i mean what are you doing over there what what are we doing let's see if we really have an enemy over there let's get it let's take it serious let's get it done and let's get out of there if we don't have an enemy and it's a lost cause get out of there either way i don't know what we're doing over there anymore it's, it just seems ridiculous well, and that's the argument with everything. I mean, if you go back to Desert Storm back in 1991, it was a quick hit in and out, got the job done. Sure, Saddam was in power, but you look since since that's happened, three major dictators in the Middle East have all gone down to terrorism, shall we say, Saddam Hussein. And, yeah. And I'm thinking of the other two. Oh, we got bin Laden. And Assad in Syria, Gaddafi in Libya. Yeah. Right? And do you think there's a coincidence, though, that they all wanted to leave the World Monetary Fund to set a new gold standard? Uh, you know, that's one, of the, that, that's one of the conclusions that I've entertained. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I would be cautious to say that Saddam Hussein was a good guy or that any we're number not saying, of these... We're not saying they were good guys, but let's face it. Taking them, uh, those three, let's say Hussein, Gaddafi, and Assad out of the Middle East, right? unfortunately, there are certain people in this world that obviously need to live with a little bit of oppression. It's sad to say, but look what's happened as a result of you know, giving them, lack of a better term, American freedom. Sure. Yeah. No. And, 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 you know, you touched on the whole, uh, they were, they were candidates who, who wanted to, uh, to, to leave the world monetary fund. And I'll tell you, <laughs> the powers that be do not like that. Um, I've hypothesized and researched the idea that, 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 that might be why Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, he wanted to, uh, give control of the money back to the people and actually signed a bill to do so shortly before his death, which resulted in that not transpiring. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I can't obviously draw that conclusion concretely, but it... it
All right, it seems like we're back here. We're going to hop out for a break while we check out these conditions here. It's raining here, people. There's a lightning storm going on due to the storm, so we will check back here momentarily. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio. I'm your host, Dave Scott. We'll be right back. Looking for a great weekend getaway this fall? Hi there, this is Dave Scott. Come on up to the heart of British Columbia for the first annual Spaced Out Radio Caribou Paracon, being held at the Spruce Hills Spa and Resort in 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia. Speakers from all over North America are coming to discuss Bigfoot, UFOs, ghosts, and intuitiveness for the three-day event, September 29th to October 1st. For more information, go to spacedoutradio.com and click on the Caribou Paracon banner and book your tickets today. Come to BC, where the paranormal is waiting for you. The SOR Sightlines is a place for you to find answers to your strange experiences. Hi there, this is Mike Schmidt. If you have had an encounter with ghosts, UFOs, Bigfoot, ETs, or anything else that doesn't make sense, head to spacedoutradio.com and file a Sightlines report. All information you give is 100% confidential, and I will personally help you find the answers you need. SOR Sightlines, your answers are a click away. Have you got your Cosmic Passport? If you need one, tune in to Cosmic Passport on Spaced Out Weekend. This is Elizabeth Anglin, ET experiencer, spirit medium, and host of Cosmic Passport. Each weekend, I'll be bringing you interviews and support from other paranormal experiencers and the best in intuitive spiritual guidance from across the globe. It's all happening starting at 9 p.m. Pacific Time, midnight Eastern, on spacedoutradio.com. Hi there. I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with U4COP. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries, so tune in at spacedoutradio.com to the final Monday of every month from Butch Wachowski's Strange Days. This is your medium, Joanna, from Spaced Out Weekend, Two Mediums and a Large. I would love it if you would come and join us with host James Tyson every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. Together, we will take your calls and your questions live. Our goal is to provide you with a positive outlook on deep questions that you may have. Questions regarding love, relationships, money, or whatever else is on your mind. Come and check us out at spacedoutradio.com. This is Eric Markham, news editor for the Spaced Out Radio's The Encounter Online. We have put together a great team of writers and journalists from all over the world to bring you top quality paranormal stories, from alien encounters to the latest conspiracies. You won't find any of that fake news here. True stories and top-notch reporting as we look to bring these experiences to the mainstream. The Encounter, online, only at spacedoutradio.com. Patrolling the Pacific Northwest, we are always on the lookout for the strange and unassuming stories that real people are experiencing. Hi, I'm Vincent Zunza from Pacific North Weird. Me and Alexandra Sullivan have teamed to bring to you those odd stories that never seem to make it into the mainstream. Stories so weird that we'll leave you scratching your head wondering, is this real? It's as real as it gets with Pacific North Weird. You can watch our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. Become more intimate and interactive with Spaced Out Radio. Join our Space Travelers Club with your new membership. For $5 a month, we'll provide you with special access to the website, monthly prize draws from books to psychic readings, along with monthly newsletter, private interviews, and more. Sign up today to be part of Spaced Out Radio's experience. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio, or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Don't have time to listen to Spaced Out Radio Live? Wherever you are, the car, the office, the shower, or even if you're traveling, we're right here for you. Each Spaced Out Radio show can be found on iTunes, TuneIn, and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. 
It's the perfect way for you to catch up on our shows. For more information, just head over to our website, spacedoutradio.com, and tune in to us today. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Strange creatures lurking in the night. The sounds of wind walking in the forest. Hey, buddy. Odd Sorry about that. It's, just, oh, it's, it's where I'm broadcasting. The this is fucking love. internet here. Hi there. This is author Robert ah. Murphy. And I would love yeah. to join you. Yeah, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Second Wednesday of every month on our journey in so, the unknown land of yeah, at yeah, spacedoutradio.com yeah, 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 no, 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 no. everything in between hey they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing did you know that spaced out radio runs seven days a week hi it's james tyson from spaced out weekend every saturday and sunday night starting at 9 p.m pacific midnight eastern you can join me and my guests for some great chatter about what's going on out in the universe or even in that dark part of the basement you really don't want to go back into. Well, let's find the answers to your experiences together. So come on up to Uncle Jimbo's cabin on the weekend. For more information, look us up at spacedoutradio.com. The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and hashtag Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Now, back to the program. I'll tell you what. No, I'm just... I know. <laughs> Everybody, we are back on Space Out Radio. Yes, my mic was live. Yes, I saw said a bad word. You know, that's what happens when you deal with internet radio. I do apologize to all of our listeners out there who might be a little upset that I dropped an F-bomb, but I'm a little frustrated on this end because when you're in a makeshift studio like I am right now, it's just a pain in the butt. It really is a pain in the butt, but it is absolutely, you know, necessary to keep the show going. So apparently <laughs> that's what we are doing. Jamie, you, usually I go through this big intro. I do just want to recognize that tomorrow night Dave Shock will be with us. We're going to talk about the CubeSat 4 disclosure. Dave Schock works with a company who is building a satellite. They will put it into orbit from the Mojave Mojave Desert later this summer where it's going to go up about 180 miles into the sky to look strictly for UFOs over its three-month journey, and we will make things happen with that tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time. You know, we're on WQEE 99, Rock the Key, Revolution Radio, everything, you know, United Public Radio Network. You know the whole drill. Bill Cardwell, I know you've got that password out. Kip for Rhinos. Kip for Rhinos. That's your password. I'm rattled here, Jamie. I hate when technical snafus happen. And so if you're a tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist like I am, okay, remember that. Just remember that, uh, you know, this wasn't a technical government snafu because we were talking about the government. No, no, it wasn't. Basically, what it was is an Internet problem here. Jamie, I'm going to try and and hook up with the other studio. I'm going to call you right back on Skype, and we'll get this other hour going, okay? Let's, Let's do it. So bear with me two seconds here, my friend. All right, so we're just going to be trying to get a hold of Revolution Radio here. You know, like I don't have enough stress being in my house. Seriously. 
I just want to be back in my house. Hi, Revolution Radio. We had a little bit of a technical snafu here on this end. So, you know, the internet signal cut out on me. So what's happened here? And I want to explain to people who are wondering, what the hell is going on? Why does this sound so amateur? Okay, well, let me explain why. So we bring Jamie Sexton back in as well. I'm in a makeshift studio right now. And where I am staying, it doesn't have the best internet provider going, okay? Basically, if you're used to things, oh, I don't know, like fiber optics, well, I'm not in that area right now, okay? (laughs) I am not in that area, so... Basically, yes, I know I dropped an F-bomb in Revolution Radio. You didn't hear that. But this internet sucks here. But what's happened is I'm in a makeshift studio right now because of the forest fires in British Columbia where I am evacuated from my house. So literally all I'm trying to do is get the damn show on the air. And sometimes the internet gnomes don't really want to... You know, cooperate. Exactly. Jamie Sexton (laughs) from Rebel Planet News. I'm glad it's you, my friend. I'm glad it's you. You know, (laughs) that's all I got to say. And apparently the effing internet is now going to... I'm sure that'll be a meme for someone. Big picture of me with a microphone and effing internet. That's just (laughs) the way it is. Oh, I got to laugh here because Bill Cardwell who sets the password every night for the SOR Space Travelers Club, every time I get the password right, he gives me a big mention. So who does he make a big mention meme out of? You're going to laugh at this because it's actually one of your buddies. One of my buddies? One of your Uh, buddies. Who does he make the meme of? Carrot Top. (laughs) Nice. So here's this picture of Carrot Top for my big, or pardon me, as he puts, my effing big mention. He's got a picture of Carrot Top for me. Nice. Yeah, so (laughs) you and Carrot Top, you guys have been friends for a long time. Yeah, uh, uh, I met him through uh, my buddy Vinny, and then uh, Vinny, I think, met him through our buddy uh, uh, Video video Bob from, uh, from Dallas years and years ago, and Man, I've been I've been to more carrot top shows than I can remember. Um, but you know, the funny thing is, is that you know most comedians I can't watch you know repetitively. Every time I went to carrot top show, I loved it. So if you're ever out in Vegas, shameless plug, but check out Carrot Top. He is absolutely worth checking out. He's a funny guy. Now I got a pe- bunch of people saying, "No, it wasn't the internet. It was Carl the alien out my window, <laughs> trying to, trying to get to me here." But that's okay. That's all oh. right. Yeah. No, it wasn't Carl. It wasn't Carl. It's you know. I I think I have more chance of a moose running over these cheap wires with its antlers than I do of <laughs> Carl showing up. Honestly, <laughs> honestly. You know, well, this show has just gone all hell in a handbasket right now, to be honest. Yeah, all I good. I'm serious, man. This has rattled me. It's rattled me. I can tell. But you know what? We can rein it in. Let's rein let's, it in. Let's rein it in. Let's rein it in right now. And, <laughs> you know, uh, where do you want to go this hour, my friend? Normally I ask that during the break, but I got a little rattled with this whole thing. Where do you want to go? Ooh. What happened? I don't know. What happened Let's let the here? audience decide. I don't All right. Know. You guys decide. And no, it's not gnomes. No, it's not forest fires. I'll be glad when... <laughs> I'll tell you, Jamie, I'll be glad when I get home. You, you know, know, I think you said you had had some, uh, some questions about uh, McCain. John McCain, yes. And I'm not going to try and kick the senator while he's down, okay? Because, right. you know, God bless him and we pray for his health because... You know, brain cancer that he has is very inoperable. But there's a lot of people who have said, you know, John McCain is past his prime for doing what he does on a governmental level. He's 80 years old. He's been in the same position for, I believe, almost 30 plus years. You know, yes, he's a war hero from Vietnam, a former prisoner of war and everything. But there's also controversy around McCain where many believe he is the godfather of ISIS. You know, 
is it is it time for for someone like him to step down, or should the people of Arizona continue to have the ability to keep electing who they wish to elect? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, again, I, I agree with you. Not don't kick the man while he's down. I, I, I've never really been a big fan of John McCain's politics. Um, uh, I've always my personal bias in politics have have generally fallen a little more on the conservative or, uh, side on the right side but uh even even having said that mccain i i've just never really had a good feeling about him um and um i think he's in my opinion i think mccain might be part of the old guard of washington that that I'm not too particularly fond of, and uh, I don't I don't like his brand or his style of politics. I think that that's kind of that old guard of of, of Washington sort of lends itself to the corruption that I think we need to all kind of clear clear out. Um, but uh, as far as the Godfather of ISIS and all of that, I don't I don't know. I think. I think there's so many layers to that onion that it'll probably never get peeled. Um, but yeah, I don't. I, I'm not. I'm not. I've never really been a, too big a fan of his, of his politics. It does say something because Jamie, one of the things that we have seen, and I realize you can't trust the internet for everything, okay? But there are a couple of very famous photos of John McCain standing beside leaders of ISIS in the Middle East when he was on tour there a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. When you see that happen with somebody as popular as McCain, you know, meeting with terrorists, whether it's to overthrow a regime, a government, a dictator, or whatever, that's a dangerous, dangerous move in the game of world chess to be playing when you're doing that and yet you're losing american citizens to those same fighters right right well there there there's a lot of that type of thing that goes on with politicians a lot of it um you know and they they always have a handy excuse as to why this was going on or why that was going on and um you know it's just hard to know because you know the average citizen just doesn't have the resources to uncover a lot of those things. Those are, those are some of the things that I will be probably addressing with uh, Rebel Planet News. We'll probably be investigating those things as time goes by in a more journalistic fashion and trying to peel those layers of the onion away and get down to things. I think there's some, mom some momentum out there, uh, especially in alternative media nowadays, with that mindset. I think a lot of the public doesn't trust mainstream media, slipstream media, as I called it earlier. They don't uh, trust uh, their politicians, and they haven't for the longest time. And they want the truth. You know, truth's a powerful thing. And I, and I think that there seems to be this momentum right now to demand it, to demand it out of the networks, to de demand it out of politicians. And if we're really going to have change, uh, in that direction, it's not going to be pretty. It's going to be messy. And I think we're seeing some of that right now. But I think we're seeing some messy politics and a lot of feuding and things going on. But, you know, changing things around and moving it the other direction, if that was ever going to happen, I, I, it wasn't going to be pretty. It wasn't going to be easy to do. You know, you got to break some eggs to make an omelet. And I think that's that may be what we're seeing right now with a lot of these shakeups in Washington. But does this mean, OK, we have senators who are able to have unlimited terms and yet we have a president where if I and I know I'm looking at this from an outsider's perspective here. OK, but this is the way I see it. Please correct me if I'm wrong. The president gets elected. Basically, his first year, he goes about ripping apart what the previous government did, no matter how long the terms were. Right. And then from there, he's got about a year to a year and a half of true governance before he has to start worrying about the next election. Because right. your elect elections take a year and a half for some reason, which I think is ridiculous. That's my opinion. 
Okay, right. so, so if he gets elected again, then you basically have two years of governance, maybe two year and two and a half years before he becomes a lame duck president towards the last 18 months of his term because now the focus is on the next election. So how does anything really get done from a presidential manner where out of eight years, he's really governing maybe three and a half out of four? I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, I think that term limits um, in some cases maybe should be extended, but in in other cases, like with senators and and other politicians, I don't believe in... uh, I don't. I don't believe in in, in the uh, career politician. I, I don't. I don't like that. Um, I don't. I don't think it lends itself to a fair system. And there's just way, way too much room for error. Way too much room for corruption. Um, especially when some of these guys get rooted in for, you know, five, ten, fifteen years, and then they've made side deals with you know both domestically and abroad and. They make promises they've got to carry out. And I, I think there's just a whole lot of room for corruption. And uh, I don't support it. I don't think politicians sh- uh, should be career-long politicians. I just don't. I don't, I don't think it lends itself self to fair practice at all. And especially when you point out the fact that a presidential term is only four years, eight if they get reelected, but... As you suggest, at least a year of that, maybe a year and a half of their of their first term is eaten up with campaigning again. Um, so I, I don't I don't think it lends itself to anything effectively getting done for the people's business. Mm-hmm. Um, so so you you point out a couple of really you know good observations that that I think we need to look at. I don't I don't like the idea of someone being in the Senate for, you know, 15, 20, 25, 30 years. I think that that's far too excessive. And, you know, it doesn't really have anything to do with age per se. I think it it more has to do with just, you know, being in there that long. And, you know, I think fresh minds, younger blood, not young, younger in terms of age, but new blood, you know, in the office, uh, I th- I think it's a good thing. I think it, it keeps the process motivated. I think it it keeps things fresh, and I think it you know um, you don't get the stalemate that we've got. And you know, Jamie, I know our politics. Me being north of the border, we still use a different system that you use. We're still more on the autocratic type, monarchy type system here. All right. right. And there are no term limits here. In fact, senators is more of a is more of a uh, a lifetime achievement award type position that is, a, in my opinion, a waste of money here in Canada. A huge waste of money. That being said, we don't have term limits up here, and the people still seem to make the change. Usually, about every twelve years, eight to twelve years, they'll make the change. Sometimes it'll go to sixteen, but rarely does it go beyond that but right. the, but the one thing that i can say where i like our system just a little bit more than what i see down there is it seems like our election doesn't last as long like your elections leading up is 18 months it's an 18 month reality tv show mm-hmm. this our past federal election where Justin Trudeau became prime minister, God forbid, as of last year, and I know there's a lot of Canadians who will agree with me and a lot who will disagree with me, okay, but it was the second longest electoral run in Canadian history. Do you know how long it lasted? Take a guess. Five months. No. Eleven weeks. <laughs> And that, and that was the second longest? Second longest. 11 weeks. Wow. Okay. Amazing. 11 weeks of, and and here's the other thing that I like about our system. Each electoral party, and in Canada, there's five parties, okay? Each electoral party is only allowed to spend a limited amount of money. Right. I, I, I do like that about your system. I do like that. Um, I, I don't 
you know, I don't think that would work here uh, without extreme conversion over a long time. And I don't even know it's, if it would be the an appropriate, you know, system for us. But I, I do think it's a, a a very interesting idea that you 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 have a job to do. This is what you have to do it with. This is, you know, and it, it, it kind of it kind of changes the game a little bit to where a person is more motivated. You know what I mean? And I think in, with our system, we live in such a, a complex political system over here and so much room for error, so many gray areas for people to do deals and side deals and with those long-term limits and all that sort of thing. It's just there's so much room for fallibility, and you see it all the time. Um, you know, unfortunately, not enough people are prosecuted for it or, or called to task. And even when they are, you know, you see these big Senate hearings where people seem to be getting grilled in front of Senate, in front of in front of Congress, and and they don't. But nobody's ever prosecuted. Nobody ever goes to jail. Nobody ever loses their position. You know, it's. I, I think there's a whole lot of theater over here in politics, and I don't like it. I, 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 think, I don't think it serves us well at all. I think if there were shorter term limits, more accountability, and maybe even, you know, like your system lends itself to, maybe even like you're on a limited budget. And I know everybody has budgets, but I mean ones that are enforced. You know, our, ours are not enforced. Everything's always overinflated and over budget. And, you know, budgets well, are say, just, they're, that, they're just suggestions here. And that happens here. And, you know, the, the way it works up here is people finally get sick of it. When they start, when the public here, up here, starts feeling that the bureaucracy is taking advantage of the elected officials and the elected officials are taking their payoffs or whatever you want to call them or playing favors so to speak that's where the public kind of stands up and says usually after you know eight to twelve years finally stands up and says you know what that's enough you know that's what happened with our prime minister stephen harper terrible set of hair on him first off you know (laughs) really bad hair you know but on the flip side he started getting edgy and cocky and a lot of Canadians decided to go for the younger Justin Trudeau because they felt Stephen Harper was becoming, for lack of a better term, too American in his policies, especially what we called Bill C-51 up here that he trudged on through rather than putting to referendum or debate, which would be very similar to, you know, the Patriot Act. Right. All right. And yeah, I'm familiar with all that. I followed that. Okay, so basically Canadians said, well, we've had enough. You're starting to become a little bit of a bully. You're out. Now, technically, as Gail points out, she says, isn't there even a time limit on prime minister? No. No, we don't, because why change a good leader? Why change a good leader? The law is in place where we trust the law up here. Okay, and I'm not saying that we're better. I'm not saying that whatsoever. So those of you waving the stars and stripes, keep doing it because, you know what, it's okay. Every country is different. We respect you, respect us. So, you know, we trust that law and and that democracy that if somebody starts getting an ego, well, we'll show you via the next election that lasts usually about six to eight weeks, except for the last one, which was 11, right? Right. You know, but it's easier for us. You have to understand it's easier for us. We're not 350 million people like the United States. We're 37 million people. So it's easier for us to shift things on a quicker time limit. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a huge consideration in itself. Um, but I also think that these, uh, these political races are dog and pony shows. And I think it's just, like I suggested earlier, just a way for people to feel like they're invested in the process. And if we had an eight-week election process, I don't think that I don't think they'd be able to get away with that here because something that brief, you know, I think wouldn't make for a good show. People wouldn't feel invested. 
Um, but, you know, I also believe that the American public, is, their apathy uh, is, is to blame for a lot of this. We, we as citizens are to, to blame for a lot of it, not just the politicians, because we, we allow this to happen. We allow this dog and pony show to continue. And instead of, like I suggested earlier, instead of really coming together and holding the people in Washington accountable collectively, both sides of the aisle, we buy into the dichotomy. We buy into the partisanship. And we let that dog and pony show become reality for us. You know, we fight more over things that we're really not even informed or educated on. And I'm talking collectively, you know. Um, personally, I probably watch more news than anybody I know. <laughs> but the average the average citizen doesn't do that. They don't really keep up with that sort of thing. And, I, I you know, you see all sorts of YouTube videos and things like that where, you know, um, these these amateur reporters will go out with their um, their microphones and interview people who are walking by and ask them pointed political questions. And people just aren't informed. They they don't they don't even know you know basic things like you know uh, who who's the vice president or you know and and. I, I think that, but yet they want to be yet they want to be passionate about a position when really they haven't done their homework, and I I don't think that's great. Let's move the politics aside here and let's get something into more conspiratorial here. One of the things that I've been looking into, Jamie, and I know you have a little bit of an interest in this because you have tried to figure out what the hell is actually at Area Fifty One is the entire secret space program. Do you believe that there is a secret space program hiding within the black budgets of the government, or do you think that this is something that is totally far off? You know, uh, uh, I'll be honest with you. I've never really been able to, uh, to find out anything concrete on that sort of thing, but it is, as you mentioned, an interest of mine. Um <clears throat> I'm always interested because, you know, NASA is uh, not a it, – it, it, it's, it's, it's subsidized by the government, but it's a private agency. So – and a lot, and not a lot of people know that. So they're, they're free to do really what they want on a private basis. Um, they don't have to disclose anything with the public because of that. Um, so – you know, there, there are some disclosure agreements, you know, they're supposed to tell us things that are about things that are funded with public dollars and things like that. But, you know, they're funded a lot by private uh, organizations. So because of that, they don't have to really share with the public everything that they do or know. Um, so there's there's all kinds of room for things to be going on. And I often wonder that. In fact, I was talking to Tiffany about that um, a few days ago where, you know, you hear a whole, bin, a whole bunch of talk over the years about, is there another planet in our solar system? Is there another planet? NASA denies it and denies it and denies it. And now they're slowly starting to introduce the idea that, okay, there is another planet, you know, and it, it's like, you're NASA, you know, <laughs> You probably knew this a long time ago. So why is it that you're not disclosing these things to the public? You know, it, it just lends it. To me, people, if you're going to hide a secret, it's probably because you're up to no good for some reason or, or something. They, people don't have secrets for good reasons. They're usually bad reasons. So I'm curious, but yeah, I don't. I don't really know of any particular programs, uh, space programs, but it is an interest of mine. Well, you know what? I always said, and I've said for a long time, what replaced the SR seventy one? Something had to replace it, 
And I'm sure it goes well beyond that as well. And recently I've been actually, and, I'll, and I suggest to you, Jamie, if you, if you get time, that I'm efforting to try and get this gentleman on the show with us. I'm, I just started trying to get communication with him today. A gentleman named Michael Schratt. That's right. S-C-H-R-A-T-T. He is, if there is one, an expert on the secret space program plus experimental aircraft and and he's an aircraft historian, so on and so forth. And I've been listening to a few of his conferences recently, and it just blows me away what could be hiding out there. And we're talking above and beyond what everybody expects is the Aurora program. You know, and we've talked about the Aurora before. But, right. but I mean, there's so much technology out there that could be could be flying that we don't even know. Right. It's scary to think that there is unlimited budgets for this, and yet, once again, to bring up what's happening in Flint with the water, we have that situation. There's no money to fix the water system. Right. Well, yeah, and you you wonder what those motivations are. You know, if there are programs, are they actually producing something? If they are, what is it? Why is it such a secret if they're not or if the program's slow? Is it just justification for spending money that they that would be better spent somewhere else? You know, th- these are the problems I have with bureaucracy in general. When you, when you create an institution, a government institution, or even a gov- government subsidized, subsidized in, uh, institution, you leave a whole lot of room, a big bucket for a lot of money to go in, and it just seems like these things never, never really produce the results, whether it be health care or military programs or anything else. First of all, the programs, some programs that are designed to be temporary are never temporary. They, they just stay and they grow and grow and grow and they become less and less effective for the good of the people. And, uh, yeah, so I, you know, all that sort of thing to me is sour especially when it comes to secret stuff or military stuff. I I believe in having a strong military, certainly, but, I mean, how many trillions and trillions of dollars have we spent on things that the public isn't even aware of or approved or, you know, or maybe we don't even need, you know. Meanwhile, we can't even have good drinking water. So I I agree with you. And it kills me to say that because... As someone who absolutely loves military aircraft like I do, I want to see this. You know, I want to see these these black projects because I want to see what the what the minds of humans have come up with. You know, it just absolutely intrigues me. Yeah, I, I have a curious mind like that as well. You know, I've told you about the the uh, the times I've gone out to Area Fifty One to see if I could see anything going on. Um, and we, we talked a little bit about that. I should take another trip out there. We Wait should take your butt, your buddy and go out. Yeah, we should go out and uh, look for unicorns uh, near Area 51. Oh, my God. Can you imagine <laughs> if all of a sudden a unicorn flew over? Oh. <laughs> the camo dudes would be wearing rainbow outfits. There you go. <laughs> now, At- it's, it's starting to sound like something else now. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I think it's Pride Month in Canada, so we'll just leave that for a different night. But <laughs> moving on with with the topics of the night, you know, it seems the topic of fake news seems to all of a sudden become a dying subject. Yes, there's the war uh, of memes going on, and it's more the public continuing on. Do you believe that people are getting t- uh, tired at this point? with the whole fake news topic? Yeah, I th- you know, generally people um, have short attention spans. Um, so, you know, that was a news cycle. And like you know, um, news cycles come and go. Uh, I don't think it's a dead issue. I think it's going to continue uh, because I don't see the uh, slipstream media letting up on Trump anytime soon. I think that's going to be an ongoing battle for a while. And so generally that the general theme of that is going to carry on for a while. And I, for one, would like to see 
a continuation of the challenging of, of different media outlets. So I, I you know, I, I like to see that fueled a little bit in, in because, uh, but, you know, like I said, the American public and the public in general in the West has really short attention spans. Um, and we get distracted easy by, you know, whatever the news topic of the day is, whether it be OJ or this, that, or the other thing, you know, we get distracted easy. And there's only so many hours of the day. And it, 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 you know, news interferes with people's routines. So they're not as invested as they should be. But as far as the fake news narrative goes, um, you know, it was a big deal for a minute. Um, but I don't think it's a dead issue. Not, not with, uh, not with Trump in office, you know, I think he's going to have an ongoing battle with them for a while, which is unfortunate. Um, but at the same time, it has turned some attention towards, you know, uh, media outlets being having to be more responsible about their reporting. Speaking of OJ, do you think it's any coincidence that he hits parole the same year that Ford plans on reintroducing the Bronco? To the public. <laughs> is that just me? Is that just me who is who is saying that there is something odd about that? <laughs> That's awesome. I I don't know. Do you think he might be a? Uh, you think they might ask him to be a spokesman? You never know. <laughs> you just never know. <laughs> no, but seriously, I can't believe he's getting out of prison in October, just in time for the 2018 Ford Broncos to come out on the sales line for Ford. Isn't that nice? Yeah. No, yeah. But, but seriously, I mean, this with, you know, with, with him coming back into the fold, I mean, this just opens up another Pandora's box of media drama, something that the media shouldn't be focusing on. And yeah. this, and I bring that up because of the whole fake news and the BS entertainment tonight type reporters that we are getting now. You know, what is your opinion of that? Is this just going to be something along the lines of just another soap opera that we're going to have to deal with in the media? Yeah, unfortunately, I I, I, I think you're exactly right. I don't think, you know, pe- I, you, uh, you hear a whole, like today, I, I saw so many posts today of people saying, oh, I wish OJ would just crawl in a hole and go away and blah, 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 blah. True, but... Just in saying that or just in posting that, you're part of the cycle. You're part of it. You're commenting on it. You're putting your attention into it. Um, we're talking about it now. He's a public figure. He was involved in um, the trial of the century. So I don't really think that um, we should expect that he's going to just quietly go away. It's, it's going to be part of the deal. As far as far as you know reputable news agencies spending time reporting on it and talking about it um and they will you know they will um i think i don't think that's responsible but our media does focus on really trivial matters and it just kind of it kind of reveals them it says more about them but you know the public eats it up and as long as as long as it gets views they don't really care. They don't really care. As long as they can get viewership, um, they'll sell out. They don't mind, you know. If they can do an OJ interview and get millions and millions of viewers to watch, they'll do it. Absolutely. And it does come down to ratings when it comes to the media. You know, it does come down to ratings. It does come down to advertisers buying that because the more ratings, let's face it, that means there is more people viewing. More people viewing means more commercial time, which means more money. It is a, a cyclical and ugly business that the media has turned into a profiteering center rather than getting the message out. And we have debated that ad nauseum on this show. Yeah. However, however, there does come a line where, I mean, going back, let's go back 20-some years to the original OJ trial. That was basically the entire start, Jamie, of our new system changing from actually reporting stories to reporting drama. Um, 
at least drama that we knew was drama. I think some fake stories were put out before then. We didn't know they were dramatized. But yeah, you're right. It's. I think that that was a pivotal point in our culture where, you know, trivial matters sort of, uh, you know, and I, I, um, I remember watching news networks, and I they probably still do this, although um, I don't catch it as often. But not even the OJ chase, but I, I remember watching the news and having it on in the daytime, and. Los Angeles police would just be chasing an an average citizen running from the law and the entire country would be glued to the television watching some yo-yo you know run from the cops for 45 minutes for an hour and I'm thinking to myself is this really newsworthy that the entire nation has to watch one county their sheriff's department chase one speeder for 45 minutes But people watched, and the fact that people watched was something that the 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 corporate entities at those networks paid attention to. They're like, "Oh my God, you know how many viewers we have right now? You know how much advertising we can sell when when a car chase is going on?" So you know, every time they had a car chase, they'd throw it up on on the screen because they could sell laundry soap. Or whatever, whatever widget they can advertise. No, understandable. And, and let's be honest. I mean, who doesn't like a good car chase? You know. I mean, yet it always seemed to be some guy sitting in a 1986 Toyota Tercel trying to outrun the the police cruisers. Right. And, you know. <laughs> Or the helicopter. You can't you can't outrun a helicopter. I don't know why people even try anymore. Why do they never turn into an underground parking lot? This is what I want to know. If I am getting away from the police in a high right. speed chase, I'm getting off the freeway, I'm trying to find the nearest shopping mall that has a parking garage. Right. A- am well, I ju- am I just too logical about this stuff? Seriously. Well, no, I think that's great advice, and there you have it from 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 Dave Scott from uh, you know Spaced Out Radio. If you're running from the cops, look for an underground parking lot because this is good advice. This is sound advice. <laughs> yeah, but it's not even sound advice. It's logical, Jamie. It's logical. <laughs> Stay off the freeway. The helicopters are following you. You know. Then well, you're gonna- I mean. Then you're, you're going to lay down on the, hold on you're going to lay down on the ground cuz you're going to give up then you know 6 6 to 10 police officers are going to literally jump on you beat the living tar out of you so now you're getting hurt for no reason on you, camera on yeah. camera and they're claiming yeah. it's self defense let's be yeah. honest they're claiming it's self defense that they had to you know you're laying on your stomach flat out but somebody still had to kick you in the head for that you absolutely know. You know, and let's be honest here. Get into that underground parking lot. Every mall has one, one yes. way or another, or even one of those raised parking lots that goes up I, three, four, five stories. Get I think that's a wonderful idea. Yes, and yeah. you should carry an extra change of clothes with you. So when you go under there, that's the first thing you do. You change outfits, leave the vehicle, and and you're you're pretty much out of there. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, but I don't. Know. I think we're assuming that the person who's running from the police might be logical in the first place. But oh, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, just aim for the underground parking lots or the skyrise parking lots. That's all you have to do. Well, yeah, I, I think know. it's good to buy. <laughs> Honestly. It can't be that difficult, you know. But getting back to the original point, I know we went off tangent there. The media loves it, the, and the public loves it because the public feels that that they are a part of the scene, and that's what live and breaking news is. I remember a couple of years ago, there was a gentleman and his dog stuck on a cliff. The dog had slipped over the edge of this cliff and landed on another cliff that was very, you know, maybe six, seven feet. And one of the local helicopters 
was taking complaint phone calls. Well, the the news station was taking complaint phone calls saying, get out of there, let the police in search and rescue, you know, do their thing. So they actually had to do a test on the camera for the public to show that their helicopter, their news helicopter, was actually about two miles away but could zoom right in with their camera to get a clear shot that looked like they were hovering maybe 150 feet away from this guy. You know, so people love that. They love the idea of being right there so they can tell their friends on social media, oh my God, did you see what happened? You know, did you see what happened? And how much of that trend, getting back to the whole social media subject then, Jamie, how much of that trend from breaking news like that has now connected to social media? Because people now want to be the first to inform their friends. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I I think it's just part of normal human psychology. I, I don't, I, you know, the system lends itself to that, and then and then the influence from that, you know, uh, lends itself to to human psychology. So it it's sort of a a cycle. You know, we I, I think it's normal. I think we're just seeing some human behavior amplified because those means are out there now to feed into it. Um, I, I don't think we're seeing anything that isn't normal human behavior. I mean, before there was the internet, you know, people still slowed down in traffic to look at a train wreck just because they have morbid curiosity. It's, it's the same, same thing, same psychology. I get that, but I can tell you this. I mean, the fear if we talk fear-mongering, I got a phone call today from Mrs. Spaced Out Radio freaking out, thinking that there was another fire up here and I was being evacuated. In the meantime, because she's down on the coast and she goes to this emergency services, which is supposed to be checking their own website for weather reports and everything. And right. here's this person volunteering for emergency services saying, oh, that area was hit by lightning. There is forest fires right there. It's being evacuated right now. So she called me in a panic. Where are you going? Where are you going? I said, what do you mean? There's no fire. Huh. You know, there's no fire here. And that was a social media thing. It, it, it ended up on social media that there, this area was being evacuated. But in, a yeah. state of, but in a state of panic, I can understand where that's happening because everybody is on heightened tension. You know what I'm saying? Sure. But for a car mm-hmm. chase, that's just ratings. Right. Well, you know, I said uh, somebody was talking about the OJ thing today, and I said, you know, as much as this guy is probably not interesting anymore, you know, he made a claim today in his parole hearing that he wasn't going to do interviews. He said, I've already said I'm not going to do interviews. That's, you know, that's not true. I mean, how much money can OJ have left? You know what I mean? I'm sure that he's going to end up doing interviews and people are going to end up watching because it's just morbid curiosity. And the next book is coming out. Uh, there's got to be a book following this. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, m- undoubtedly. But, Jamie, do you not see, though, and I don't know if you are like this as well because you're on a different journalistic side than I am. Do you not see a lot of your friends and compatriots getting rid of their cable now because they are sick of this? And, you know, we see the cable companies, whether they're down south, whether they're up here, jacking up their rates, forcing you to take channels that you don't want in order to have their package bundles that you can get. But do you notice a lot more people in your inner circle or outer circle turning off television because they just can't handle it anymore? Um, I haven't noticed it on a personal level, but I have read a lot about it. It, it, it there are a lot of ratings down uh, on cable news networks, and cable news networks uh, were very high, very high, but now they're very low. So cable in general is suffering because of it. I think um, a few weeks ago, when all those uh, meme wars were really hot. Uh, and they're still going on, but when they first kicked off, CNN's ratings were down to something like thirteen percent. They they were 
they were they had less ratings uh, than Yogi sixty year old Yogi the Bear cartoon reruns. That's how low their ratings have been. Um, that's bad. That's real bad. Um, so yeah, they're feeling the pinch. And uh, like I said, I, there's there's a good side to that, which I support, which is calling them to task, um, which they should be. And then there's the downside to it, where <clears throat> when when again do you begin to trust uh, media outlets, and where do you go meanwhile? But you know that just leaves room for alternative media and places like Rebel Planet News. So I'm not going to complain too much. No, you can't complain because somebody's got to get the story out. However, right. you know, the TV companies have to start seeing that their, their their greedy way for advertisement has to be, you know, has to delve with the pro, or gel, pardon me, with the programming that is coming through. And if people are no longer jiving with the programming and turning to, to alternative sources like Rebel Planet, like Alex Jones, like Sean Hannity and others, love them or hate them, does not matter. Okay, right. but people are tuning into those. They're leaving other areas to go in there. That yeah. still has to be cause for concern. Do you think the cable companies are starting to panic that people are starting to tune out? Sure, absolutely. I think the thing is, though, if, if they're if they're driven by um, if they're driven by money, it's simple, and they just need to reevaluate their formula. If if lies were fueling their pocketbooks before and they were getting away with it and the public is starting to demand more honesty out of the media, just sell them honesty. You know, it's, it's, there's, there's still money to be made, still news to be gathered and just, you know, disseminated, but just do it in a more honest way and people will tune back in. You'll, you'll make your money and, and you'll be doing a more noble thing than lying to people. Anytime you sacrifice the truth for, you know, for money is not a good thing. We're down to just about two and a half minutes here with you, Jamie. Let's break down Rebel Planet News for people. And you can go. You got a little cold there, bud? Yeah, a little bit. How do you get a cold in the middle of the desert? Oh, man. It's cold. I run around naked, so. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> that does not surprise me whatsoever. But, um, you know, on the on the flip side, you know, tell us a little bit about Rebel Planet News, people tuning in for the first time because, you know, we have new listeners tuning on in every time, so we want to make sure they know what Rebel Planet's all about. Well, we we are an alternative uh, news site, and we'll be launching this year. Uh, still under development currently, but um, we'll be covering, you know, national news topics international news topics uh our primary focus is going to be global events politics and um anything that plays out well on the on the national level um we'll cover sports we'll cover some national weather things like that but um we're also going to be doing podcast some video broadcasting and um We'll be doing a whole lot of uh, op-ed pieces, both written and uh, radio and format. Um, we want to, with those, we want to kind of take on a little bit of the uh, a little bit of the alternative topics that mainstream mo- media doesn't like to touch on. You know, um, some of the more fun things like what's going on uh, behind some of these secret programs and things like that. So. Uh, I'd like to see us explore those kind of things, and um, it might not be the focus of, of our agency, but um, we're not going to be afraid to tackle some of the things that mainstream agencies don't want to cover. Exactly. Probably the most important question I have to ask you tonight is a man who loves to play the guitar. How many guitars should a man own? Well... How much room do you have to store them? That's that's basically what it comes down to. How yeah. many good, how many guitars do you pack in these days? Uh, not too many these days, but I remember I was looking at some photos. Uh, I think it was about a couple of weeks ago. It was 
purging some photos, going through them, and I was like, I, I had at one point I had all my guitars out on guitar stands and just was admiring them, taking pictures of them, and I, I think I counted thirty two wow. at that time. So wow. probably not as many as Bumblefoot, but <laughs> <sighs> yeah. The double neck will continue. Jamie, you hold on here. I'm going to wrap this thing up. Tomorrow night on the program, we have David Schock joining us. We're going to talk about the satellite that he is helping build that is going to go up into orbit later this summer, looking strictly for UFOs on a three-month mission. 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time. We get things going at spaceoutradio.com. We want to say thank you to everyone listening in on our terrestrial radio stations, WQEE 99, Rock the Key in Noonan, Georgia, United Public Radio Network on 107.7 FM, all over the internet, in our chat rooms, on Twitter, and wherever else. Thank you so much for tuning on in. I will be back here in the hot seat of SOR headquarters, part two. Hopefully tomorrow night we won't have an internet break. I do apologize for that. But... I would love for you to continue to share the show because together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Bubblefoot, take us home.